going yeah. live. That's right. As we float through the, the universe here with billions upon billions of galaxies. With a B. <laughs> with a B. <clears throat> I'm going to say howdy to all of our friends out there on chat. Okay, this looks good. So, David, do you think that Bart Bach would be happy to know he's on the Global Star Party? I think he would be thrilled. I think he would be absolutely thrilled. And I'm imagining him sitting right next to me with his eyes glued to the screen uh, to see great. this. I really think he would love this. And I'm almost imagining he is. Hmm. And he would say, you know, what? Have, where have I been the last 40 years? I haven't done very much. I've been a very lazy man. He'd probably <laughs> say that, too. <laughs> He's been resting, you know? Yeah. But that's all right. I think that the seeds of inspiration that he put out there, though, are real, still are very strong. And I think yeah. that, uh, <clears throat> you know, I think he'd be very pleased to know that as well. Okay, well, we've got some people already in chat here. Uh, so um, I see Mike Wiesner saying howdy from Arizona. And uh, I was looking at Mike Wiesner's uh, post uh, that uh, he did on Facebook today. And, you know, just a really beautiful image of his observatory, all kind of, you know, uh, a, a time image you know with it all lit up in red it looked cool so we got the space stuff here hello everybody this is rich williams from astor florida 32102 usa well here we go <clears throat> Astronomers spotted a black hole repeatedly munching on a sunlight star thanks to NASA's SWIFT satellite. When a star gets too close to a black hole, gravitational forces cause it to bulge and break apart into a stream of gas. This is a tidal disruption event. In some cases, scientists see what they call repeating tidal disruptions. That's what's happening here with an outburst called Swift J0230. The sunlight star orbits a monster black hole. Every few weeks, the star gets so close that the black hole pulls off about three Earth masses of material, but the star survives. Astronomers saw it in a distant galaxy, thanks to a new way to analyze data from Swift's X-ray telescope. They developed a new way of scanning the instrument's observations so that they can quickly identify and study events like these. After nearly two decades in space, SWIFT is still learning new tricks 
and teaching us new things about our cosmos. Hello everyone, this is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance. And I'm very happy to uh, introduce you to the 136th Global Star Party, the size of the universe. Um, I had uh, the good fortune to run across a couple of, uh, of full length lectures from the legendary astronomer Bart J. Bach. Him and his wife uh, Priscilla uh, had written a book about the Milky Way. Um, and um, I actually sold uh, his book uh, at a uh, telescope shop called OPT back in the 80s. And um, I love the, uh, the, the way that he wrote about the Milky Way. And uh, um, I think I actually even carried posters. They were these long posters that showed uh, the Milky Way taken from both the northern and southern hemisphere. And um, anyways, uh, these uh, lectures uh, were recorded uh, by WGBH Boston, the same guys who do the science program NOVA. Uh, this is back in 1957. And take note that um, the, the content of the presentation from Bart Bach had information that was then state of the art for, um, for the, uh, the distance scale of the universe and such. But I think what you'll find is that his presentation style, uh, the way that he uh, educates people uh, is something that um, you, know, you would have to see him do uh, to really understand how amazing it is. Um, <laughs> Also, uh, I have the good fortune, we have the good fortune to know David Levy. And if you've been keeping up with Global Star Party, uh, you've, you've gotten to know David Levy as well. Uh, but David knew Bart Bach and, uh, and Priscilla um, uh, personally. And uh, uh, so we have a connection. And so I'm gonna let, I'm gonna turn this over to David uh, who can introduce uh, Bart Bach, like none, no one, other people can, because uh, David also wrote the biography for uh, Bart Bach. So, David, thank you for coming on to the 136th Global Star Party and um, making this special introduction. Well, thank you. And today, I'm going to combine my poetical, <clears throat> my poetical quote of the week with um, my introduction of Bart Bach. It was kind of an interesting thing. I was, I just relocated to Tucson, Arizona. I bought a house on Cary Street, a very small house. It's not the house that I'm living in now. But uh, a few weeks later, my friend Peter Jedeke came by for a visit. And we had a good time and looking up at the night sky and doing observing. And I remember, I remember in fact, one night we were uh, observing the sky and a cloud, a little cirrocumulus cloud appeared in the northwest and started slowly across the sky and then disappeared in the southeast. And I looked at it and I said, Peter, you've just seen the Arizona monsoon season. <laughs> and he got a good laugh out of that. But as I was driving him to the airport, he's sitting in the car next to me and he said, David, your task, should you choose to accept it, is this. I want you to interview Bart Bach. And uh, 
uh, because I'd like to write an article about him and uh, I want you to interview him for me because I wasn't able to do it, get a chance to do that. And I thought, Peter, I can't interview Bart Bach. He's one of the most famous astronomers in the world. And I just can't call him up. He said, sure you can. And uh, so I was really a little annoyed at Peter at the time. But as I let him off at the airport, I resolved that I was going to call Bart Bach. I picked up the phone, called his number, and he answered the phone. This is Bach, he said. I am fresh out of the shower and I'm dripping wet. I have a beautiful girl in the next room who is also dripping wet. So be quick. And I said, Dr. Bach, this is David Levy calling. Be quick, be quick. And I, and I said, I would like to interview you, but uh, this is obviously not a good time. How about if I call you tomorrow? Be quick, be quick. I said, Bart, Dr. Bach, I'm going to call you tomorrow. And he said, no, 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 no. You're talking. That's a good time. Let's set up a time. How about tomorrow at 3.30? You come to my house and you can interview me. The next day, I was really shaken by that first call. But I arrived at his place the next day at, I think it was more like 4 o'clock. And uh, he let me in. And uh, I had five questions that I wanted to ask him that I'd written down. And he was sitting on, a, on his couch and I was sitting in a chair. And I said, Dr. Bach, when you were director of the uh, Australian, the astronomy department at the Australian National University, uh, you wrote a book called The Astronomer's Universe. And the first five words in that book were, astronomy is on the move. Dr. Bach, how would you explain those five words now? And how would you explain them 20 years after you wrote them? I never got to ask another question. He started answering, painting a wide picture of the origin of the universe, of the Milky Way. After an hour, I had to excuse myself to get another tape from the car, which I ran out and got, got in. And he continued answering the question for about two hours. And uh, I was, I've never forgotten that, my first meeting. We eventually got to be very, very good friends. And when Peter arrived for another visit later that year, I was able to introduce Peter to Bart Bach. And by then we were pretty darn good friends. And uh, uh, we, the friendship was based on science, but it wasn't limited to science. He, uh, we talked about <clears throat> girlfriends and things like that, which was pretty odd. Because Bart, uh, when he was married to Priscilla, was very conservative. He did not believe any of his students had the right to have extramarital affairs. And when he found one who did have an extramarital affairs, he shunned that man. And, uh, you know, so it was really pretty odd when his friends found out that after Priscilla died in 1975, November the 5th, 1975, that he actually had uh, another relationship with a woman who was also married to someone else at the time. And uh, he really fell in love with this woman. I think her name was Jackie. And uh, I remember one day, years into our friendship, he called me and he said, oh, Bart Bach is not happy today because Jackie has canceled on a visit to him. And he was crying. He was sitting there on the phone crying his head off. I talked with him for a while. But then I called a friend of his, Elizabeth Maggio, and uh, suggested that she might want to visit with him, which she did. And she spent the rest of the afternoon with her friend, Bart Bach. Uh, it was really, really interesting and really exciting how he was able to remember the marriage that he had with Priscilla and the beauty of that relationship. And how he told me about the uh, her last days 
And they went to the opening of the Flandreau Planetarium in 1975, November the, uh, I think it was November the 4th, 1975. And they went in and they got there very early and they went to the back where, where they had set up a room called the Galaxy Room. And uh, they were looking at the beautiful transparencies of the Milky Way and all the other things that they could see. And uh, Priscilla stopped and he said, she said, at the picture of the Atacarina Nebula, she just stopped and froze and said, Bart, you know that I'm going to die soon. And Bart started to argue with her, said, oh, no, no, you're doing fine. Said, just shut up and listen. You know I'm going to die soon. I'm telling you right now that here is where I want to be, in the Atacarina Nebula. And uh, this is where I want to be. When I am gone, you can always find me in the Atacarina Nebula. Four days later, Priscilla passed away. And one of the few mistakes that Scotty has ever said regarding me when he said that I knew Priscilla, I knew Priscilla only through Bart. It was just a few years after she had passed that I was able to get to know Bart, but I'd never personally known Priscilla. Bart had always told me that Priscilla would have loved to meet me, but she never had that chance. I have here with me two books. One of them is the first edition of Bart and Priscilla Box, The Milky Way, that they wrote together. He, uh, he actually went through five editions of that book, the fifth one that he had to revise without her. And the other book I want to show you is The, the Man Who Sold the Milky Way, when I, that I decided to write a biography of him. And, um, and this is a book that is, I believe, I'm not sure it's still in print, but probably is by the University of Arizona Press. It is my biography of Bart Bach. And it is from this book that I'm going to quote today's poem, which is not really a poem, it's more a more of verse um, prose. And um, I wrote it when I wrote the biography of Bart Bach. And I'd like to share that with you now and then pass the baton back to Scott, who will begin this lecture that we're all waiting for. When we all think about the, um, the size of the universe, we usually think of Edwin Hubble. I don't think of Edwin Hubble. I think of Bart Bach. And I remember being at the cemetery last week, arranging the um, arranging the unveiling of the tombstone for Wendy that'll take place on the 17th of December at 11.30 at the cemetery. But anyway, as I'm about to leave the cemetery, Scotty called and he told me that he had discovered this fabulous lecture by Bart Bach. And he said, maybe we should do it on Bart's birthday, which will be April the 28th, 1906. And uh, it will mark the 40th anniversary of his death, which was on August, in August of 1983. Anyway, here we are with the, pre the opening to the preface of my book, The Man Who Sold the Milky Way. And it goes like this. In the beginning, there was no Bach. And the Milky Way was without form and void. But darkness no longer is upon the face of the deep. For Bart J. Bach has helped explain our galaxy to us. And on that note, I give everything back to Scotty. Thank you, Scott, for letting me do this. Oh, thank you so much, David. Um, uh, I, um, before I start this, uh, this uh, uh, video segment, uh, you know, I want to give recognition that this was uh, produced by WGBH uh, in Boston. Um, I believe that uh, Bart Bach was uh, doing these lectures live because the the recording is a kin is a kinescope, and the way a kinescope works is you have um, you have a a motion picture camera aimed at a television. 
and then you're you're recording what's on the television. Uh, the resulting recording uh, that I saw was very low contrast. There was quite a bit of uh, audio uh, distortion in the background, some you know rumble and hiss that you might expect uh, when you see an old movie. This was uh, filmed in 1957, so uh, he would be giving the lecture, I think, live, and then the cameras right there aimed at the television monitor and um uh so uh um you know but i i really want to thank um uh, uh, uh paul newton who works here at explore scientific for uh, making corrections to the audio the audio might be it might be better than what it was originally um uh, 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 the the uh, the visual video part of it uh, probably not as good as actually seeing it done live, but uh, certainly better I think than um, than what they got from a television screen. So, um, but uh, anyways, uh, through the through modern software and the uh, you know the the fact that the uh, video is now beyond copyright. Um, I think it's it's wonderful that it's out there for the public to see. And uh, David, I would really want to thank you for giving this presentation because it brings life to uh, you know uh, an otherwise kind of um, uh, not lifeless, but uh, kind of uh, how would I put that? You know, kind of a stoic um, uh, type of introduction. So. But, uh, thank you, thank you, Scotty. I'm really looking forward to this. I'm sitting here, my emotions are all in a turmoil <laughs> as I remember somebody that I really loved and really respected and admired. Yeah. So here we go. Um, Bart Bach uh, and his lecture, "The Size of the Universe." My task tonight is to tell you quite a bit about the arrangement of our universe. The arrangements of the stars, of the galaxies, of the planets, of the sun, how they all are together in the universe, what their distances are, and how they are related to each other. This photograph that we have here is probably as good a one to start on as any. Because on this photograph we see dots, and every dot is a star, and these star dots are each of them represent suns. All of them suns, very much like our own sun, some are fainter, some a little brighter, but all suns in their own right. These little places that we see here, these smudges, they are galaxies. They are large star systems, well beyond our own star system or our own Milky Way system. And these star systems themselves are at very great distances from us. We shall find that these can be observed to distances as far away as 2,000 million light years, a really very great distance into space. The stars are somewhat nearer by. But before we turn to the stars, let us turn first to the nearest neighbors that we have. Let us turn to our own solar system. The plan that I have to start out with our own solar system and gradually move out from the sun to the planets, from the planets out to the nearest stars, from the nearest stars in our own star system, our own Milky Way system, to the farthest regions and beyond. And I hope to give you an idea as to how these are arranged. Now the first photograph that I have here is of a very familiar and basically not very interesting object, the moon. All of you have seen the moon. You know that it's a companion satellite to our own Earth. It is not very far away from our Earth. Its distance is only a little more than 200,000 miles, which means that at the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second, a light ray goes from the Earth to the Moon in a little over one second. Many of you will probably remember how about 10 years ago, the, for the first time, a radar beam was bounced off the surface of the Moon. That radar beam, signal sent from the Earth, went towards the Moon, returned by the Moon to the Earth, took a little over two seconds to complete the whole trip. What we say is the distance to the Moon 
is about two light seconds for a little over that. But now let us really come to the important body in our solar system, which is the sun itself. Here is a photograph of the sun with some of the familiar sunspots shown in one or two positions. The sun is a star. It happens to be to us the most interesting star because we happen to be very close to it and our Earth is one of the planets around our own sun. The distance to the sun is 93 million miles. Now you might say, here he gets busy and throws large figures around and tells us about distances that are so large that we cannot imagine them. Let us just try a moment to imagine what 93 million miles is like. Well, many of you must have had a car that has run 93,000 miles. My own car has gone at the present time more than 86,000, so I know just how far it is to go about 86,000 miles, and I can imagine very well how far 93,000 miles is. Well, if you imagine a parking lot with 1,000 parked old cars, all like mine more or less, these 1,000 cars will have traveled 1,000 times 93,000 miles, which would be 93 million miles. I hope that that will give you an idea that the distance is great, but not a distance that we cannot imagine. Now, if I continue to talk all the time in terms of distances in miles, the figures would become so large and so unwieldy that they wouldn't make sense. For that reason, we measure in astronomy our distances more in terms of the time that it takes for a light ray to cover a given distance. Light moving at a rate of 186,000 miles a second travels the distance, well, that is about seven to eight times around the Earth in one second, travels the distance to the Moon in a little over one second. It takes eight minutes to go to the Sun. We say, therefore, that the distance to the Sun, at 93 million miles, is a distance of eight light minutes, since it will take a light ray eight minutes to travel that particular distance. Now we ask, what other distances are there in the solar system? Let us look at one of the other objects in the system, and we turn to the biggest and best of all the planets that we have, the planet Jupiter. Many of you have probably seen Jupiter. You probably have seen the belted structure, which comes in a cold atmosphere of ammonia and of methane. These little black spots, by the way, are shadows thrown by the satellites of Jupiter on the surface of the atmosphere, this planet Jupiter is at a distance five times as great as the Earth from our Sun. Therefore, five times 93 million miles is the distance from the planet Jupiter to our Sun. In terms of light minutes, five times eight is 40 minutes. It would take a light ray about 40 minutes to go from the Earth, from the Sun to Jupiter. If we move out, there are other planets. For example, there is the famous planet Saturn with its beautiful ring structure. It's a little farther out. Let us not worry too much about the details of the figures. But we can say that the solar system, with all its planets, is contained roughly within a distance of about 40 of these astronomical units, 40 times 93 million miles distance from the Sun. That system has some very distant outlying members. The comets are probably the ones that go farthest out. There you see a very fine example of one of these comets. The comets, they are the objects that go farthest out in our solar system, and therefore we go up to distances of about 50 times this 93 million miles. To complete this, let us look at the diagram that gives you some idea about how this arrangement really works. Here we'll see Neptune, one of the outer planets, Pluto lies beyond it, Neptune up here, Uranus down here. Then we move in from Uranus to the planet Saturn, to Jupiter, to Mars, and the Earth. This distance from the sun point here to there, the next one, that is about 93 million miles. At the speed of light, therefore, we can say that the dimensions of the solar system, cutting once across the entire system, are of the order of about, say, 10 light hours. In other words, if you were to start from the Earth and right after breakfast and go out and want to visit all the planets and do so at the speed of light, it would just take you a full, long day's work 
and you would be home in time for a late supper. In other words, the dimensions of our solar system are measured in terms of light hours. Let us just note a few of these things on the blackboard. The first one that I would like to record here is that the distance from the Earth to the Sun is 93 million, that must mean we need six zeros with that, 93 million miles. That is equivalent to eight light minutes. The second one, that the dimensions of the solar system, so we go through the solar system, from one end to the other, in about, say, 12 light hours. So moving at the speed of light, 12 hours to go through the solar system. Well, that gives us our first basis for discussion. We know how far it is now from the Earth to the Sun, what the dimensions are of our solar system. And now we turn to the system of the stars. In this very fine photograph that I have here, you will see a section of our Milky Way. That happens to be the section of the Northern Cross of Cygnus. Those of you who know your stars may notice DNEP up here. Alberio, the end of the cross, is just off the photograph. Here we have the cross bar. In this photograph you see a great many dots. And you remember from the earlier one that every one of these dots is a star, that every star again is a sun, and that these sun stars are in many cases brighter than our own sun, in other cases intrinsically fainter. In other words, our sun is a pretty average sort of a star. When we ask about distances to the star dots here, they will come out something of the order, not of light minutes, but they are measured in terms of light years. Let me first of all remind you that whereas the dimension of the solar system is measured in terms of light hours, 12 we wrote on the blackboard, that the distance to the nearest star, so from our sun and the planetary system to the next star, is four light years. The first thing that we notice about the universe is that it is a very big and empty place. Here we are with our solar system, about 12 light hours. You got to travel at the speed of light for four years to reach the nearest star. When you take an average star dot here in this photograph, the distance of that star is not four light years, but more likely 4,000 light years. We see, therefore, that there is a terrific depth to the space that we have. Let us look at this photograph a little further. For from it, you can begin to see some of the basic features of the structure of our Milky Way system. As we come from one corner of the photograph, and move slowly closer and closer towards the center. We come to more and more star-rich regions. You will find that generally everywhere in the sky. If you look at the band of the Milky Way in the sky, that can see, be seen very beautifully at certain times of the year, then you will find that the band of the Milky Way is a region of high star concentration. There are more stars as you come from a distance and go towards the Milky Way in the Milky Way and at some distance away from it. In other words, it looks as though the Milky Way band is a real band of star concentration. We find that the stars in the Milky Way are at many different sort of distances. Some are nearer, some farther away. In other words, the Milky Way has great depth. Our sun is a star near the central plane of a large system of stars known as the Milky Way system. A highly flattened system, as we can see, Go at right angles to it, very few stars. In the plane, many stars indeed. Here we have a section in the Milky Way. Let me draw attention to two other features. One of them, this little nebula, called the North American Nebula for obvious reasons. Here you can see almost the Panama Canal, the Gulf of Mexico, Cape Cod is missing, and here is the coast of California. Well, this nebula 
is made out of gas. It is gas that floats in between the stars. Because for every three grams that we have in the region around the sun, in terms of all sorts of matter, two grams are squeezed in the stars in the sun. The other gram is left to float free as gas and cosmic dust in between the stars. This dust is shown, for example, here in the Gulf of Mexico, or the Pacific Ocean, or the Atlantic. Tiny little icicles that float in between the stars. Now let us have a good look at the Milky Way by itself. The next one shows you the outline of our Milky Way chart. Remember that we had this region up here in our photograph. We know already that these clouds are not really clouds, but they are really star dust. Effects of a great many stars coming close together. In the Milky Way, we know that the concentration of stars increases as we go from the outside towards the central band. We notice something else. Some parts are exceedingly brilliant, like this one up here, near Scorpio and Sagittarius. Another part, the part that we see from our latitudes in winter, near here, Taurus and Orion, that part is very much thinner. What is the case? When we look at this photograph, we see here certain parts are very bright and brilliant, like this part that we see in the summer, Scorpio, Sagittarius. Other parts are very much weaker, like the part in Taurus the Bull and in Orion that we see in our winter Milky Way. Why is that? Simply because we are in the central plane of the system, but pretty far away from the center itself. Let us have a look at one more of these gas clouds of the Milky Way. Because we shall find that they, the clouds like this up here, they really give a general outline of the structure of our system and especially delineate where the spiral features are in our system. The dots here, suns again, the gas shown as white beautiful clouds, the little things like this little black hole here, the keyhole nebula we call this, they are produced by the cosmic dust. The Milky Way system, if you could see it from the outside, it would probably look something like this system up here. We were probably living in a point in this large star system, like the one shown here by the black arrow. Our point is roughly about 27,000 light years away from the center. The diameter of the system, approximately 100,000 light years. A few years ago, Mrs. Bach and I drew a diagram of our Milky Way system. And it still serves pretty well to show you what dimensions are involved. The only thing that we need to do today is, whereas a few years ago we thought this was a scale of 100,000 light years, it is now more likely that this represents 80,000 light years. But if you take that one correction, this gives a good picture. Looking down on the Milky Way, the sun here, the center of the Milky Way here, a distance of 27,000 light years. 100,000 light years roughly from one end to the other. Seen sidewise, there you have the general picture of our Milky Way system. One final point. The Milky Way moves around, rotates around the center. From here to there, 27,000 light years. We move with a speed of 140 miles per second. That means, while I say one, two, three, the sun, the earth, and everything with it has gone 140 miles. How long does it take us to go once around, just one complete circuit? Well, the next graph will show it to you. You will see that it will take you quite a while to complete one circuit, 200 million years. So one galactic revolution takes place in 200 million years. We call that often one cosmic year. This will give you an idea of the tremendous size of our Milky Way system. So much for the Milky Way. Let us write a few of the facts on the blackboard. First of all, that the diameter of the Milky Way system. I write it as MW system. Is about 100,000 light years. Let us write up the next thing, the distance sun to center is 27,000 light years and the distance to the nearest star 
distance sun to nearest star is four light years. There we have sort of the facts of life as they affect the stars and as they affect the Milky Way system. And now in the final few minutes, let us get out into the universe of galaxies. Each galaxy is probably a spiral galaxy, just like our own system is, like the one that I've shown you already. To give you an idea of it, let this be a typical Milky Way system. A hundred thousand light years from here to there, our sun, 27,000 light years from the center. To give you an idea of the arrangement, let us just take these Milky Way systems and suppose that all of them had the same dimensions as our own. Some are in fact a little smaller, but that is beside the point. The important question to realize is that these systems are roughly about one million light years away. Which in other words means this, that if we want to build up the universe, take a series of these disks, make each of them a hundred thousand light years across, put them a million light years apart, and then throw them out in space, like we're doing here. There they go, be sure they stay a million light years apart, keep it up for something of the order of about 2,000 million light years, 2,000 million light years, and you have the universe of galaxies. Now there is the universe. Let us have a look at it and see some of these things in a little more detail. Here is one of these galaxies, much like our own probably, spiral structure, gas, dust, all the various things in it, shown rather nicely in a photograph with the 200-inch telescope of Mount Palomar. We show you another one that we see edge on, and rather than face on. And there you can see, again, the central bulge that we had. Our sun would be in a position like this. This black belt in the middle is produced by the cosmic dust that shields off the light from the more remote objects. Let us look still at some others. Then we'll find out, for example, that one of the most famous of all is the famous Andromeda galaxy. You can see it faintly in the sky as a faint star sometimes with a little blur. When you see it in a photograph, you see the spiral structure coming out in it. You can actually photograph with the big telescopes the individual stars in a galaxy or Milky Way system of that sort. This one is probably in reality a little bit bigger than the one that we've had already. Let us look now at some that have a slightly different structure, like this one up here, where we come into one that is irregular in shape. This is a satellite galaxy to our own Milky Way system, the Large Magellanic Cloud. But you see there are the common components of gas, stars, and dust that are ever present. Well, let us finally say, how far can we go out? Here is one of photograph of a really distant group. Here we're coming in terms of distances of 10 million, 30 million, 100 million light years and bigger. We're really moving out in space. Finally, when we come to the real distant ones, we will find that we come into distances that are still far greater. We find, for example, that there are some that recede from us with terrific speeds at very, very fast rates of the order of about, say, this one here, 20,000 kilometers per second. That is about 14,000 miles. Some have been measured with speeds five times as big. This distance has a distance of about 100 million light years. The greatest distances for which this expansion effect has been measured run as high as about 500 million light years. We go beyond that. The faintest galaxies that we can photograph are probably 2,000 million light years away. Well, in the last minute, let us return right to the blackboard and see where we are again. And here we have our picture. I'm starting now, we might almost say, from the bottom up. Remember that the galaxies measure about 100,000 light years across, some a little smaller, some a little bigger. Let us remember, too, that the nearest star is even still four light years away from us. Remember that these galaxies at these dimensions are about ten times as far apart as their diameter that we go up to distances as great as 200, 2,000 million light years. Remember too that in these light years that light goes around the earth seven to eight times in one second, eight minutes to the sun, 12 hours to the solar system. 
four years the distance to the nearest star, 100,000 light years per galaxy, and there we have about the story of our universe as far as dimensions are concerned. You So, uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, uh, David, what, do you, uh, what was your take on this particular lecture? Uh, yeah, that, that was, let's see if I can uh, mute myself here. Yeah, you're unmuted. Okay. Okay, you can hear me. Yes. I, felt, I felt as though Bart had come back from heaven and was sitting right next to me. He was listening to himself. I cannot give a lecture as good as that. <clears throat> I mean, my mind would wander. But listening to what the what the, the feeling and the emotion with which he gave that presentation is beyond anything I could imagine myself giving. And it was wonderful. I was honored beyond anything, beyond any way that you could say to be sitting and imagining Bart sitting next to me, listening to himself, talking about the size of the universe and using our own Milky Way galaxy as a, um, as a feeling, as a center post to leap off and discuss the uh, origin of the universe. This is 40 years later, it's actually 60 years after his lecture, or more, and it is almost impossible to imagine how our understanding of the size of the universe has gravitated, has moved so far away from the way we saw it in 1957. And yet, the feeling is the same, the emotion is the same as it was then. It was just such an honor to imagine Bart sitting next to me and watching himself it's such a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And thank you. Back to you, Scotty. Thank you very much. That's great. Okay. All right. Well, um, I am, uh, I think I'm going to be like a lot of you out there. And I'm going to be re-watching this video. Uh, as I might have mentioned, I did kind of watch it from a technical standpoint after we did the restoration work and all the rest of it. Um, I can... Um, for those of you that might want to show this to an astronomy club or whatever, uh, we're real happy to share the uh, actual file uh, that we restored. Um, but there are a couple of other places that you can find this video. Uh, one of them is at archive.org, where I did the original download from. Uh, but uh, I think there's a couple of universities also that have downloaded the video and show it on their university website. So. Um, but that, that's fantastic. Uh, and I'm going to bring David Eicher on. Okay. David, uh, your talk is next, your presentation's next, but, uh, uh, what was your thought about this particular presentation? Well, I thought it was fantastic. And, and I only got to know Bart at, for the last couple years of his life, uh, there and lar largely at the Texas star party and in, in Tucson a little bit. And it was through David that I got to know him. Um, oh. And I think you were working on or, or just had finished working on his biography in those couple of years. This would have been 1982 and three, I think, mostly, mm -hmm. um, oh. David. So, so you know, that that it brings back a flood of memories of what this guy was like. And, and you know, this in 1957, this was a long time before I, I knew him, but but the same quirks and sort of, you know, home, you know, friendliness and, you know, deep caring about sharing the information about the cosmos with others comes through in this talk. That's the way I remember him, just the three of us talking, David, when, you know, when we were at the Texas Star Party there and so on, um, you know, is very much, you know, it, it's like being revisited, as you said, by by him. By him. And, and I thought it was interesting. Now we know, you know, that the universe, the diameter of the universe is 93 billion light years, and maybe more depending on dark energy, you know, it could actually be infinite, you know, so it's a lot larger than we would have suspected in 1957. But the basic, those simple basic numbers he was talking about there, 
are still legitimate. What he mentioned there, those numbers now still. And I thought it was really interesting. Uh, you could almost hear Bart, you know, one of his favorite things I remember him saying, and David, I know you know this better than me, you know, all the good stuff's in the Southern Hemisphere, he used to like to say, you know, which right. is not much of an exaggeration, you know. And of course, he spent a great deal of time in Australia with his observatory directorships. But I thought it was very interesting that he showed when he was talking about the Milky Way is maybe similar to a galaxy like this. And he showed M83 and a barred spiral. And we knew that the Milky Way was a barred spiral. That was a surprising confirmation in 2008. Yeah. And that, was, that struck me as sort of a weird coincidence. Wow. Here, this is in 1957, and he's showing a barred spiral, talking about this back, you know, deep in the days when we thought the Milky Way was another SB spiral like the Andromeda galaxy. That was a little spooky, I thought, that he showed M83, which is very much the kind of galaxy that we turned out to be. Hmm. So, so that that really kind of struck me as, as amazing, you know. But his insight is really, uh, I think, remarkable. So. Yeah, and and of course he and Priscilla together, you know, the book that David showed a copy of the book, uh, it's a proud possession. I have the fifth edition that is signed by Bart, Bart inscribed by Bart, but that was in its day up through the early 1980s, and uh, you know. That was the book on the Milky Way, bar none. That's they were the yeah, definitive period. experts on the our Bible. galaxy. <laughs> and period. End of story. You know, and and so it's really you're hearing the greatest mind on the subject of the galaxy talking about this cosmic distance scale in this lecture. I mean, you know, he was at the very top, and so it was just amazing to see. I had never seen that before. Oh, David, that was, that was really so interesting to hear you say that. One of the books that I have in my own library that a lot of you may have in your libraries is The Golden Book of Astronomy. And it's one of my favorite books that I had since a child. And if you open that book, you get to the foreword. The foreword was written by Bart Bach when he was at the Australian National University. Hmm. And... Uh, I think when I read that as a child was when I first got introduced to the magic of Bart J. Bach. And of course, David's biography is the definitive bio. You know, that's still a very important book, David, your biography you. of yeah. Bart. Thank absolutely. You, that that's summarizes awesome. his whole career. Yeah. yeah. So I created a, um, a, a mini biography of Bart Bach. And uh, at the bottom of that page, and I, I put the link already in chat, uh, you can find a link to uh, Levy's uh, biography, as well as the Milky Way book, which is still available. So, um, so it's, it's it, as you know, if you're into amateur astronomy or professional astronomy, this is probably a book you should have in your library. Mm -hmm. So one of the well, things that I would that I would like to, um, to end this particular section with before we go to David's lecture, Sure. is the dedication of uh, of the man who sold the Milky Way. I dedicated that book to my mother, Edith Paylette Levy, who encouraged me during this project's difficult beginnings and whose patience and love for my father during his last years helped me to understand what Bart and Priscilla must have lived through. Because just as Bart was, just as Bart was uh, taking care of Priscilla during her last days, my mom was taking care of my dad during his last days. And uh, and that was such an incredible comparison that I felt during the time I was writing that biography. Mm. I just wanted to share that with you. Mm. Sensational, David. Thank you for, Thanks. for sharing that. And what, what memories are tied up in those days back then that we had, you know, yeah. getting to know him. He was, uh, just, you know, there. you can say this about a relatively limited number of you. Somebody who comes into a room and is just larger than life, you know, he was that kind of a guy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I'm glad that we were able to, I'm glad, first off, I'm, I'm really glad that, uh, 
that these video, these uh, these films were made. Uh, and, um, you know, I know that uh, just from reading the biography of Bart Bach that uh, that he and Priscilla really leveraged uh, media during this time um, uh, when, you know, frankly, it was very expensive to do so, you know. Um, so uh, I asked um, I asked David Levy, uh, you know, what his opinion was as far as uh, Bart Bach's stature amongst uh, astronomers at that time, uh, or even at this time, and uh, you know, and I say, I'm, I'm mentioning luminaries like Carl Sagan and stuff. How, David, what what is your take on uh, uh, Bart Bach's stature in the world of astronomy today? Well, I think it it is probably it has probably diminished somewhat over the years because uh, unlike Carl Sagan, who uh, who really was a astro popularizer first and a scientist second, Bart was a scientist first and an astro popularizer second. It was very difficult to separate him, his science from his public relations. But I think that um, that he was there, someone very, very special. As I was watching this wonderful lecture, I was taking notes into my observing log. This is session number 23,967, which was today's observing session of the night sky of the sun. And uh, and I'm in my observing log, I'm taking notes from Bart's lecture. And I think it's so very special that that the um, that the lecture which we saw today will forever be a part of observing session twenty three thousand nine hundred and sixty seven. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, David. Um, okay, uh, I am um, I am ready to turn this over to you, uh, uh, Mr. Eicher, and uh, you're taking us to um, a uh, one of the exotic uh, deep sky objects, and it is Pismus Marino One. Is now that right? Am I pronouncing know, that correct? If, if people know this well and they've observed it a lot, I'm going to get up and walk out of the room, okay? <laughs> because I thought, you know, last week, last time we had NGC 6946, a pretty big, exciting object. This sure. is truly a an obscure object, mm. I think, this time. It's okay. an open star cluster, and it's in we're still in the northern sky, working our way southward toward that good stuff of Dr. Bach. Uh, but this is an obscure cluster that is involved with a, an obscure nebula, and uh, it, there's not a lot that's known about this one. So it'll be interesting to show some images of it and, and talk a little bit about it. All right. We'll take it away, man. Thanks, Scott. So I will share my screen and I will see if I can get Centaurus A, one of the favorite object of Bart's, I think it's fair to say. Um, and oh dear, um, this is on the top of the screen now. Oh my gosh, now it's covering up where I start the slideshow here. Here we go, okay. Sorry about this. It's all right. All right, I outwitted Perfect. it. There. The bar moved and was blocking me there. So anyway, yeah, Bart, I know that Bart loved Centaurus A, um, one of those great Southern Hemisphere galaxies. But we're not talking about it. Now, as Scott said, we are talking about, now it doesn't want to advance either. My golly, this computer is not cooperating. So how many of you, let's see a show of hands here or in the comments section. <laughs> How many of you are familiar with Pismus Moreno 1? Um, I wasn't before I came up with a list of these things, you know. So I was um, as of yesterday. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> this is getting to be a little weird, as they say now, at some of those old movies. Mm. Um, so anyway, this is a high latitude open cluster. It's in Cepheus. It was discovered by the team of an Armenian-Mexican astronomer, uh, a woman named Paris Pismus, and the Mexican astronomer Marco Moreno, 
Um, uh, and and again, I'm blocking part of my text here. Forgive me. Marco Marino Corral. We, we there we go. Okay. Yeah. Um, and this is getting to be a little weird because it was not known, you know, until the 1960s, hmm. not recognized as a cluster. Little data has really been reported. If you go to Simbad, you know, or Ned or anything else, there's practically nobody has studied this cluster. So there's more astronomer to uh, astronomy to do in the future. Astronomers have not yet uh, lost their job security in every respect, at least. It's about nine arc minutes across, um, but there's not a lot that's known about it out there. The faint uh, Sharpless Nebula 2-140 is involved in this cluster and presumably physically involved because the cluster is, is you know, believed to be accreting from it. It's about 2,900 light years away. And the, the nebula's bright rim is caused by a main sequence uh, HD star, and it's ionizing to create this rim, a Bach globule. And of course, Bach globules are very famous, very tiny. Uh, Bart in his lecture mentioned these pockets of dust in Cygnus and elsewhere. And Bach globules are very small, uh, concentrated areas of cosmic dust uh, that are accreting down to form protostars that he became one of the several things he became very famous for. This area is part of the Cepheus bubble, which is a big shell of gas and dust, and it's associated with a big uh, group, loose group of stars, the Cepheus OB2 association, which is in our neck of the woods in the Milky Way. So here's the region of Pismus Moreno 1, and I don't think you can see my arrow here, can you? Um, probably not. That's just for me. Mm -hmm. But you can see over le left and a little above center is uh, Pismus Moreno 1 and uh, the Sharpless 2140, which is the emission nebula that's associated with it. There's a, a double star Struve 2896 in there as well. And it's a fairly rich area of Cepheus. You know, this is up above Cygnus and still in a rich area. The Milky Way, as you can see how many bright stars are on this chart, a very small section of a few degrees in each dimension here. This is again, courtesy of Ron Stoyan and his great atlas here. Uh, and this is the <laughs> sky survey image. When I started to try to find images of Pismus Moreno 1, there aren't that many good ones out there. So I knew I was finally getting to something that was obscure, but this is a digital uh, a sky survey image. And you can see the cluster here. You might even think that it has a little bit of a bent coat hanger shape here. And you can see the wisp of nebulosity there from Stuart Sharpless and his catalog that came later. And this is a really nice image from Astrobin, the astrophotography site where lots of imagers post their stuff. Mm. Astrofin, whoever he or she may be, uh, produced this image and stuck it on Astrobin here. And this is really great. I mean, you can see in the center, just right of center, is that kind of bright lip of emission nebulosity. This is all gas. It's associated with the Sharpless object. And then the cluster is kind of the bright group of stars over much of the middle of this uh, um, part of the image in front of the dark nebulosity. And in front uh, to the right there, all the, the, the bright stars that are... Uh, just to the right of that lip of, of emission nebulosity there. So this is a weird one. If you wanna go out and look at the Northern sky, here's another image of uh, amateur image by Daniel Weitendorf uh, in Germany of the area showing the cluster and the group. And you know, if you think you've run out of things to look at with Scott's telescopes, here's one you may not have seen, which is a kind of an interesting area. Here's yet another one, uh, image of, of the uh, area as well by Felix uh, Miliero, um, which shows it very, very nicely, a little bit wider field. And you can see that there are a whole lot of stars in this small section of the Cepheus Milky Way. So this is a weird object that I don't think I've ever seen visually and is maybe worth going out and taking a peek at. And in a dark sky, presumably with an eight or a 10 inch scope, the nebula would be faintly visible as well. 
we're getting to the very end, and you're going to say, thank God, the very, I won't mention this again here probably, but this is the end of our 50th anniversary year of Astronomy Magazine here, and we have a bunch of stuff, including uh, some recollections of Jim Lovell and Apollo 8 here, the Guide to the Night Sky, the annual stuff. I had to give a talk, I have to give a talk that's coming up early next year about astronomy in the Civil War. And so I figured, well, you know, I'm getting a talk ready. I might as well do a story in a magazine about it. So that's in there as well. And I'll tell the story sometime uh, of climbing up in the, if you ever get a chance to visit the old Naval Observatory in Washington, not at the vice president's house, but the old Naval Observatory, which is at a site that's a couple blocks north of what's now the Lincoln Memorial site, you can climb up into the telescope, the refractor there through a wooden uh, entryway and a wooden ladder that's the same ladder that Abraham Lincoln used to climb up into uh, mm -hmm. an unannounced visit. Uh, David, I think we talked about this many years ago from time to time and dropped in on uh, a young astronomer um, who would, uh, what was it? Uh, this was in 1863, a few weeks after the Battle of Gettysburg. So 14 years later, this astronomer that President Lincoln and his private secretary, John Hay, dropped in on would discover the two moons of Mars. So there's some astronomical history there written up and you, too, can make arrangements if you want to and go visit the old Naval Observatory and climb right up that same ladder that Abraham Lincoln used. Also, uh, both Scott Roberts and the distinguished David Levy will be there and speaking and having a good time uh, this coming spring uh, at Starmus Number 7 in Slovakia and Bratislava, which is a fabulous place. I was there a few weeks ago uh, to announce the festival. Um, we'll, it's a hop, skip, and a jump from Vienna. So you can get to Vienna, Austria very easily and just drive right over to Bratislava. And it's going to be a festival that is full of surprises that will be mind-blowing as it always is with many astronaut explorers, Nobel Prize winners, rock musicians, and lots and lots of other stuff going on at Starma. So we hope that we'll you'll join us there. Just a few scant weeks, about five or six weeks after the big eclipse that's coming this spring as well, that will be a big highlight for all of us. So that's all I have. I will end the show and I will stop sharing my screen. And okay. Scott, thank you for allowing me to join you again. And that is a truly obscure object this time. If you go out and, and anybody talks Just next week about seeing uh, Pismus Moreno one, I will be duly impressed. That's right. That's right. So um, uh, John Ray said, he said his uh, Stellarium software found it in about half a second. So nice, nice. All so right. There you go. Okay. So it, we challenge everyone to go out there and see this uh, uh, obscure, but I'm sure beautiful object, you know, it, and it, the it, astrophotograph of it is pretty amazing. It is a pretty star field. And, you know, Cygnus has so much great stuff of all types in it, you know, even galaxies, but stuff in the plane closer to the plane of the Milky Way there of, of, of galactic deep sky wonders that we don't think of Cepheus that much, but there's a lot of good stuff there. And that is a beautiful star field with the nebula there as well. Great. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, Scott. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, we are going to leave the USA and uh, fly through the miracle of the internet all the way to Nepal, uh, where we will uh, uh, meet up with uh, DT Gautam. Now, many of you who are regulars of watching the Global Star Party will remember DT. Uh, she came on early into the Global Star Party program, uh, and she, she has given several talks. Uh, uh, on uh, different aspects of the universe. Um, but uh, she also many times will add uh, poetry that, uh, that she has done, uh, which actually inspired me to write a little bit of poetry myself. So uh, now I, I don't have anything for this particular Global Star Party, but uh, um, DT, uh, thank you for coming on to uh, Global Star Party again. 
Uh, I also want to point out that she has been uh, inducted into the Explorer Alliance Ambassador Program. Uh, you're in good company uh, with uh, many other luminaries uh, in the field, but um, I can tell that you're kind of into this for the long haul. I think that you're that you're you so far have done this for mm -hmm. your outreach work for several years. Sometimes I see young people do it for a couple of years and then they kind of fade off and stuff. But I think you're still going strong and uh, we're really happy to have you on Global Star Party and making this a part of your outreach program. Hello, Scott and everyone. Uh, so it's me, Dipti Gautam from Nepal. Uh, yeah, I just uh, joined my undergraduate uh, university uh, here in Nepal. It is Kathmandu University taking major of uh, bachelor in uh, taking major electrical and electronics engineering. Uh, so uh, I had a one year gap uh, between high school and university. Uh, so I enjoyed it. I learned it uh, through the astronomy and I completely given my time to the astronomy. So let's go through the, I would like to share my screen. <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, here in Nepal, I'm an, <clears throat> okay, sorry. I'm recently working with, uh, Nepal Astronomical Society, NASA, uh, and I have given my full time here, uh, for this one year. <clears throat> and I had a, a little bit of more gap in global star party too. Uh, so there was a different programs I was engaged in, and the one of these Astronomy for Community Empowerment in Nepal. Uh, this is the one program uh, which has the motto to <clears throat> uh, teach the student, uh, mentor them, and make them a mentor to go to the community and serve. So what actually we do is uh, we <clears throat> train the student uh, how to use uh, uh, astronomical instrument like a telescope, planisphere, sundials, and <clears throat> uh, we train them how to use the instruments. And uh, they go to the community and uh, all different different schools of their community and train all the students uh, in their, um, uh, and so here's the motto, like mentor to mentee and mentee to community. <clears throat> So here are the uh, others program like uh, empowering them uh, before going to the community, uh, like uh, soft some soft skills, hard skills, and how to uh, handle the telescope, how to uh, handle the sun dials, planisphere, and how to be of the morally and different things uh, before going to the community and uh, teaching uh, and come in different skills. So I had my lots of time with these girls. Uh, and like, oh, uh, it was like I always give my uh, Friday times uh to them and teach them a different uh things. Uh, going to their schools and taking their time in their clubs. Uh, so there was one of the uh astronomic club in one of the school, and was I was taking it completely. And every Sunday uh, is their uh, academic prospect, and uh I used to take uh, uh two hours daily and teach them about the astronomy and how to make the planets, sphere, sundials. Not only these, but uh, different things like um, how to make the telescopes. And I recently uh I recently completed the telescope workshop, telescope making workshop where we made a 60 mm uh, reflecting telescope and uh, a 60 mm reflector telescope and a 90 mm okay uh, reflector telescope uh, so uh, this is the message tables uh, where students were making the satellite models paper satellite models and so wind science that is solar science and the satellite model is ready here and uh, they were making some kind of planets model uh, by their one and they are the uh, sixth fifth grade student uh, which are nearly uh, 11 to 12 years um, <clears throat> and they were engaging uh, their time in doing the astronomy with me and unfortunately about uh, due to the, my university time I could not continue with them and they were so sad mm -hmm. for that. Okay, so for in my place, uh, other will join uh, from our uh, society, from our uh, Nepal Astronomical Society. 
so here is uh, like all Swiss week, uh, which is celebrated in October 4 to 15 or 4 to 10. Uh, so uh, I was coordinating in my province uh, here in Nepal uh, here in 2023 too. And it's been uh, like uh, three years I have been coordinating for this World Space Week in my province. Uh, so uh, there was a biggest festival of Nepal that is called Dasai. Uh, where we celebrate the god of power okay uh, so where we take the bliss uh, from the elder and uh, like put the tikka so there's a festivals so which is mainly celebrated with the family and relatives uh, but uh, i plan to went in the orphanage home and disabled home uh, women's uh, and celebrate the same Okay, celebrate my festivals with the orphanage uh, kids and uh, teach them about astronomy and uh, observe, uh, they, they observe the Saturn, Jupiters, and um, Moon, of course, and Sun. Uh, so I went there and they enjoyed, really enjoyed it. And they were so curious about it. And they asked me about the different uh, opportunity around and like uh, I said about the global star party and they were like amazed. Oh, we can also like, uh, can we like uh, come uh, like contribute in the international platform or anything like that. Okay. Uh, so I said, uh, like, uh, you should like continue your continue your like curiosity and work on it search the opportunity around uh, so here is another uh, uh, event that is uh, held in one of the schools uh, these are the high school students uh, of, of using how like learning how to use a planet sphere hmm. So uh, these are the kids uh, from the orphanage homes uh, and who were really interested how to know like how know about the universe, about the astronomy. And uh, these are the uh, orphanage homes and disabled women, uh, which is serving for about 15 years uh, for, for her, uh, she's the uh, disabled woman, we serving for like 15 years for these kids um, in the orphanage home. So not only these, uh, I I often different workshops and seminars, and share about uh in different topics. Mainly I share that how to like how to make your career or how to get interested, how to search about the opportunity or like how I did. Uh, so uh, is I was interested. Uh, many of the interested uh people just leave this uh, field by saying like there is no any opportunity here or by they didn't like uh, research properly or anything uh, but I suggest them uh, you should like uh, research like you to, this will take some small small steps uh, toward your career uh, to make it successful uh, so uh, not only this uh, there are lots of programs I have been doing uh, like I was busy for all the weeks and there was a, a one program that is NASA Space App Challenge which I have taken pa participate in uh, for that challenge uh, we have taken the challenge uh, to act as a travel agent uh, for the space uh, tourism. Uh, so recently, uh, I didn't. Uh, my website got down, so I could not show it here. But in that uh, uh, challenge, in that hackathons, we prepare a uh, website and uh, flares, and where we have uh, given this, like we acted as a travel agent and prepared all those uh, entities and all the information about the different uh, solar systems. And we also uh, make the plannings and how this day plannings, how, how many days you were going to plan and this, um, all this uh, buzzers and everything. We made it uh, like we acted as a travel agent and prepared that project. Uh, probably I can show it uh, next in next CSP. Uh, so uh these are the things i have been uh doing uh in this now one years uh, and mm. uh so not only this i was giving my other times for the observation like night sky observations in my community and uh, like working with all this uh in the like i'm going to like uh, upgrade my uh 
uh like post to junior members to undergrads so now i'm uh, i can't give my full time but i'm giving i'm still uh, planning to continue my uh doing through online or like Sure. connecting with those girls and connecting with those kids so when i used to uh, give my time uh, earlier and uh, like uh, at least give my time in saturdays in the holiday here in nepal uh, or like uh, give my astronomy continue my astronomy here in my university oh, that's, uh, that's, so, that's wonderful okay. i didn't uh, wrote a poem now but i just wrote a small line that is a little girl asks what's the things you die for a little girl asks what's the things you die for and i just turned over my head to the thinking star is smart thank you <laughs> thank you thank you so much tt well that's wonderful uh the uh the programs that you do with uh uh nepal uh you know the with the Shinobu naso Society. group uh how how many presentations are you guys giving a year do you think? Uh, here in GSP? Yes. So maybe it's been... Uh, Astronomy pro programs for, for kids. How many for times a year are okay. you doing that? So it's been uh, two, three months. We make uh, like uh, for this uh, Astronomy Club, uh, I'm giving uh, continue my time every Sunday. Every Sunday. Wow. Okay. Well, that's a lot. And every Friday in for those girls, uh, that is the girl schools, it's Padma Kanya Girls School. Uh, mm -hmm. So I went there and I give my Friday time for them. Wow, that's uh, <laughs> uh, very selfless of you. So that's that's great. <laughs> that's great. Well, Deepti, thank you so much, and um, uh, you know, congratulations on all of your work that you're doing. I know that you're changing lives. So. And uh, you. uh, you're always welcome uh, to come back on Global Star Party. Thanks so much. Okay. Take care. Okay. Uh, we are going to uh, uh, get our segment from the Astronomical League. We have uh, Don Knapp, uh, who is a um, uh, you know, very active amateur astronomer and has been for many, many years. Um, uh, and uh, we're happy to have him on. Don, uh, you're going to be talking about the Pleiades star cluster. Yep. Yep. All right. Wonderful. <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Nice quest star you got back there on your desk. Uh, it's a joy. It's, 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 it's a joy. It really is. Mm -hmm. All right. So let me slideshow from the beginning. Should be coming through. Yes. It is. Okay, so, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about the opposite end of the spectrum from what David Eicher talked about. He talked about <clears throat> an incredibly obscure open cluster. I want to talk about probably the most famous open cluster in the sky, and that is the Pleiades. You know, I wasn't sure what to talk about this week, but last Wednesday I was out <clears throat> with a telescope, a Dobsonian, uh, with my wife, and we were looking at things in the sky, you know, Jupiter, Saturn, Caroline's Rose, the usual, and we settled on the Pleiades, and I thought, you know, I'm going to talk about the Pleiades, because I'd like to know more about it, and I bet a lot of people would. So uh, this is about the Pleiades, a short presentation. Before I go into that, I do want to announce that uh, December 1st is uh, the next AL Live, Astronomical League Live, and we're going to have J. Kelly Beatty, who is, uh, he was over 40 years at Sky and Telescope. Uh, editor and, you know, an incredibly knowledgeable astronomer. So he will be talking about mysteries of Stonechen. So that's, uh, I think, you know, it's covered by my uh, my uh, menu bar at the top, but I think it's seven o'clock on the December 1st, Eastern Standard Time. So the Pleiades, uh, if you walk out any evening, December, even January, February, and look uh, this time of the year, look to the east, you'll see this tiny little dipper up in the sky. A lot of people mistake it for the little dipper. They don't know, but it is this open cluster, the Pleiades. Now, when I look at this, of course, this view is from Palomar Observatory, so we don't see the nebulosity, but this is about the field of view I would get on a, a Dobsonian. It's 1,500 millimeter. I have to put in a 48 millimeter eyepiece. Hmm. Pretty unusual eyepiece, but to get this kind of field of view, what you have to do. That gives me about 30 power. 
And, uh, you know, when I'm looking at the Pleiades, if I can see this little double star in the middle, clearly that's a sign to me I have good seeing. Uh, it's really a better bi a binocular object. Uh, probably the best, one of the best views I've ever had. I like to do it with large binoculars. The best view I ever had was somewhere a year ago at a star party. And it was a windy night. And the Pleiades had just come up over the trees. Uh, so they were low on the horizon. The wind was blowing. But the, the stars twinkled like Christmas lights. And one of the most amazing sights that I've ever seen in a binocular telescope. So, uh, so I've always I've always been in love with the Pleiades. So, uh, known as the Seven Sisters or Messier forty five. We'll talk about who this Messier guy was in a minute. You know, I was researching this, and you can probably find several dozen names for this this cluster. Okay, uh, it's so famous. It's an asterism. It's not a constellation. Part of constellation Taurus. And 44, 444 light years away, you know, listen to Dr. Bach's presentation. These stars are our next door neighbor. Uh, they're, they're like walking out my door than our neighbors. They're so close uh, in the cosmos. So, uh, and it is one of the nearest star clusters to Earth. And it is the nearest Messier object to Earth. And probably the most obvious cluster to the naked eye this time of the year in the sky. So simulations show that the Pleiades probably formed from something like the Orion Nebula, okay, uh, M42. Uh, so maybe in a couple hundred million years, M42 will now be another set, set of Pleiades. They expect it's going to live, live another 250 million years. And then just because of the galactic neighborhood, it will disperse and we will have lost this beautiful little, uh, beautiful little cluster. So Pleiades, ancient Greece, his name comes from ancient Greece, probably from clean to sail. That's because the cluster was very important to define the sailing season in the Mediterranean Sea. I'll talk about that in a moment. In mythology, the name was used for the Pleiades or the seven divine sisters, supposedly deriving from their mother, Pleon, meaning daughters of Pleon. But that can't be true because the name of the star cluster was almost certainly first. And they just invented Pleon to, to explain it. So uh, that's where the Pleiades came from. We'll talk about this greenish gold disc in a moment, but uh, it, M45, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, abbreviate Messi as M, M45 played an important role because of uh, working on calendars. Two elements about the Pleiades were important. First, and it's still true, it's near the ecliptic in the sky. And second, especially important for the ancients, they didn't have clocks, they didn't have calendars, they, uh, they could tell that the asterism marked the vertical point, start of spring. So they knew when they could uh, start sending their, their fishing boats out again. Uh, so this is evident in Northern Europe. This is the Nebra sky disk going from about 1600 BCE. We'll talk about this in a moment right here. So the disk is bronze. Now this green is not green paint. This is the patina that bronze forms when exposed to oxygen, especially for mm -hmm. that many thousand years. It's about a foot in diameter and uh, weighs five pounds, but his gold inlay, again, like I said before, dated back, you know, a couple thousand years ago, the early Bronze Age. So they're not certain that this is the moon or the sun. And certainly this is this is a crescent moon. But here we count these seven stars. Everyone agrees this is the Pleiades. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, so the disk was found on a hill called Mittenberg in Germany. So Babylonians named the Pleiades Mol Mol, which literally means star, star, okay? And uh, they were at the top of their list of stars on the ecliptic. Here's Homer. Uh, some Greek astronomers considered the Pleiades to be their own constellation. Uh, but they do, they do have a role in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. Maybe you're old enough to remember, I certainly am. It's not that long ago, but a movie called um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. This is Devil's Tower. It played a, uh, a big role in Close Encounters of the Third Kind because that's where the aliens came down to talk to us. But in uh, Robert Burnham's Celestial Handbook, he notes a connection between Devil's Tower, somewhere in the Midwest, I forget, uh, in, in the Southwest, I forget where exactly. But uh, the Kiowa lore says Devil's Tower was created by the Great Spirit to protect seven 
Native American maidens were being pursued by giant bears. The maidens were placed in the sky as the Pleiades cluster, and the marks of the bear claws are still seen here on Devil's Tower. And this story is also told, if anyone has seen uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson in the new version of Cosmos, he tells a whole story about the legends of uh, the Pleiades uh, being placed in the sky and the bears clawing Devil's, Devil's Tower. We'll talk about another couple of, uh, I mean, we could spend an hour talking about the various mythology around the Pleiades, but we won't. So, there, so to find the Pleiades, remember this other legend, okay? The legend of seven sisters chained to the dove and sent into heaven to avoid the clutches of Orion. Orion was chasing them. So if you look at where Orion is, the Pleiades always rise before Orion because they're trying to get away from him. So that's the way, and the Pleiades is so obvious, it's simple to find. Uh, but I use Capella, and actually I took this last week. This was Jupiter when I made this chart. Uh, the easiest book uh, mark in the sky is probably Taurus, the V of Taurus the Bull and Aldebaran. Then you go up to the Pleiades. So in Japan, so we're going to talk about, for a moment, you know, we, we've been saying seven stars all along. In Japan, they called this uh, Mutsuraboshi, meaning six stars. Okay, the cluster is now known in Japan as Subaru. This is the Subaru telescope, eight meter scope. It's on uh, Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Uh, for from 98 to 2005, it was the largest primary mirror scope in the world, monolithic primary mirror scope. So they named this Subaru, which is the name they use for the Pleiades in Japan. And Subaru, again, you count six stars, they, they, they took the Pleiades cluster when they took five companies to form one. So anytime you're driving around, you see Subaru, you're seeing the Japanese depiction of the Pleiades. Galileo was the first one to view the Pleiades through a telescope. And he discovered the cluster contained many, many stars that were too dim to see. And if you look, if we count here in this, this, uh, this drawing he made, there are only six stars. So again, we, we, historically we see seven stars listed. We also see six stars. Galileo only drew the main six. He included a total of about 36 that he saw. And this is back in uh, 1610. So six or seven, uh, depends how good your eyes are, I guess. Now, are they a cluster or are they more like um, a cluster I think of that is a chance alignment is the uh, coat hanger cluster. Those stars are not next to each other in space, but just by chance alignment, looks like a coat hanger. So back in 1670, 67, John Mitchell calculated that the chance alignment of so many bright stars was only one in 500,000. So he concluded the Pleiades must be actually a true cluster of stars in space that are physically related. And in fact, since we've been able to analyze their motions, we found that they are moving in the same direction and they are a physical cluster. They're not like, <clears throat> not like, I think every constellation in the sky is a pure chance alignment of near and distant stars. The Pleiades are a true cluster. Hmm. So this Messier 45, this name Messier, many of you probably know, but Charles Messier, he was a comet hunter. And he got tired of seeing the same fuzzy object in the sky, thinking it was a comet when it actually was something he'd seen before. So he cataloged these objects. I think he did around 105 and we ended up added a few as 110 total. But he published his catalog in 1771. He named it Messier 45. So along with the Rye Nebula, the Beehive Cluster, you know, the fact that he included the Pleiades was is under some discussion because most of the objects, in fact, if anyone in, takes the Astronomical League Messier program and you, where you have to look at all these objects and find them, You'll know that most of them are much, much fainter than the, Ple than the Pleiades or than the uh, Beehive Cluster or the Orion Nebula. So they think that Messi was simply padding the books. Okay. <laughs> he wanted to have a catalog larger than Nicolas Louis de la Say. He published a catalog with only 42, and Messi wanted to outdo him. So he added, added the, uh, the Pleiades, although it's pretty obvious when you look at them that they are not a comet. But uh, it was a game of one-upmanship, I guess, back then. So the core cluster is about eight light years. And these 14 
14 stars we can hot blue stars you can find. They say someone with good eyes can see 14. I can only see a couple. I certainly can't see seven. I might see four or five. Uh, when you look at this arrangement, it is indeed a little dipper. Reminds you of Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. And some people get confused, think it is the little dipper, which it's not. But the uh, the nine brightest stars, these are the names of the seven sisters. And then here are the parents, Leona and Atlas. And uh, you know, just beneath the Pleiades, we saw in the star chart, is the Hyades. That, the, that is the V of Taurus the Bull. Those are sisters of the Pleiades. Here are the seven Pleiades. So that's a lot more about the Pleiades. You know, I got my information from the classic Terrence Dixon book, Night Watch, and a book that a friend of mine gave me about the, the Messier objects when I was pursuing the astronomical <laughs> Messier program. So uh, now we know a lot more about them. Wonderful. Wonderful. You know, the... Um... Uh, when you look at um, uh, quotes or stories about the Pleiades, there's lots of them on the internet, and people have been mesmerized by this const you know, this asterism, is what we would call it yep. as amateur astronomers. Uh, yep. But uh, I have, as you say, many, many times been out under the stars with friends, and they say, oh, look, there's the little dipper, you yep. know. And uh, of course, it looks like a, a tiny little dipper. It does. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ursa Minor uh, is actually much, much larger in the sky than, than uh, the planets. <laughs> Huge, yes, yes. But yes. It's, it's always a joy to see it in the fall because we know that not far behind is Orion with that beautiful nebula to look at. Right. And I have seen uh, visually, uh, you know, provided you have enough aperture, and you have transparent enough of the sky and dark enough of the sky, mm -hmm. you can actually see some haze around these mm -hmm. stars. And so, um, you know, it's, uh, of course, uh, in astrophotographs, especially astrophotography done today where they shoot, you know, 20 hours or 40 yeah. hours or even, you know, 80 hours of, of objects like, like the Pleiades, you see an immense amount of nebulosity there. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyways, thanks for bringing that uh, to the Global Star Party. And sure. uh, Dom, um, uh, you talked a little bit about the Astronomical League. Um, I just want to toot their horn a little bit more. You know, uh, the Astronomical League is the I believe the world's largest federation of astronomy clubs, over 300 clubs belong under that one umbrella and over 20,000 members. Uh, so it makes it uh, amongst one of the largest and most important and oldest uh, uh, organizations of its kind. So um, if you don't already belong to the league, you can, you can join a, an astronomy club that is a league club and you'll automatically be a member. Um, or you can become a member at large and you just go to astroleague.org and join up. So thanks for, for coming on again, Don. And yeah. thanks again to the one thing I would like one thing I would like to add to Don's wonderful presentation on the Pleiades. It brought me back to 19 August 1962. I was 14 years old, getting ready to go as a patient for the Jewish National Home for Asthmatic Children in Denver. And um, I went up before dawn and I drew, uh, I think 40 or 50 stars in the Pleiades using my little three inch wow. telescope. Wow. And it was really, really special. And uh, it's, it's really, it, it also, when you brought up the picture of Charles Messier, it brought a really personal feeling because when I looked at a picture of a fellow comet discoverer and um, someone who meant a lot to me in my early years as an as observer of the night sky. So I just love this presentation about the Pleiades. I will never forget it. Thanks, Don. Thank you, David. Yeah, thank you. That's great. All right. Um, so let's, um, let's go to our next speaker. Uh, we have... Um, Robert Reeves uh, with his postcards from the moon presentation. Uh, 
Robert is uh, becoming our guru of, of the, <laughs> of the all things lunar. And uh, uh, we really are pleased that you come on to Global Star Party so often. Thank you. Well, I'm pleased to be here and uh, to spread the gospel about the big bright light in the sky that um, many deep sky observers avoid. And uh, I say that's a shame because the moon is something to be embraced in addition to everything in the deep sky. Uh, it's uh, an object you can see from your own backyard. You don't need to go out of town. The moon laughs at light pollution. But... Um, as I give my presentation, Scott will notice uh, I'm not covered with sawdust right now. Yeah, all, what's the all, deal? After, <laughs> yeah, all afternoon, I've been building the uh, the cabinets that I need to store several hundred pounds of these lunar orbiter photographs oh, yeah. that I that I inherited. The original images that uh, Johnson Space Center uh, used back during the Apollo era, and now many of them are mine, and uh, I need to take care of them. So I'm making proper cabinets to uh, to 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 um, keep them out of harm's way because these are really historical artifacts. But um, today, well, the theme is the size of the universe. Well, the first stepping stone in measuring that, of course, is how far it is to the moon. Uh, sure. The moon is the only object in the sky, a celestial object that humans have traveled to. So it's the very first tentative step. Uh, science fiction notwithstanding, the reality is um, getting to the moon is hard. And uh, it's been 50 years since we sailed there the first time. And hopefully within my lifetime, we will go again. But um, tonight, um, my theme is a walk in the rain. Remember last week, uh, we walked in the clouds by um, um, touring Mare Nubium, the uh, ocean of clouds, the sea of clouds, I mean, excuse me. Well, today we're going to tour the sea of rains, Mare Imbrium on the moon. So let's see if my adventures with screen share work. And uh, hopefully you are now seeing my... Yes. It works. Whoa. This is amazing. You're, getting, you're becoming an expert at this too. <laughs> well, let's see if it advances. Uh, this is this is yep. my uh, my uh, title card, of course. Uh, postcards from the moon, and we don't need to see my menu here. Postcards from the moon, of course, is what I post every day on, uh, or most of the days. I try to do it every day on Facebook. A new picture that I have taken about the moon. Uh, uh, with a uh, description of what's going on in the picture, uh, why it was significant to me. So I uh, hope you uh, join me on Facebook and enjoy Postcards from the Moon. So moving on, Mare Imbrium itself is the huge circular Maria that forms the man on the moon's left eye. Now I uh, choose Mare Imbrium because tonight uh, the lunar phase is just beginning to expose the eastern side of Mare Imbrium, Plato Crater, uh, Aristotle, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Archimedes Crater, uh, Cassini are just broaching into the sunlight. And over the next two days, the rest of uh, uh, Mare Imbrium will appear. So uh, this is a, um, a significant chunk of lunar real estate. Mare Imbrium appears to be the largest lunar sea although it's actually the second largest, uh, uh, Oceanus Procellarum, the ocean of storms just west of it, and still in shadow in this particular picture, um, is twice as large, um, almost 2 million square kilometers. But uh, Mare Imbrium, I think somewhere in the territory of 800,000 uh, square kilometers, um, it's more um, centrally placed, and we, we see it more direct. Uh, Oceanus Procellarum is extremely foreshortened, and even though it's twice as large as Imbrium, uh, it, it visually is insignificant and doesn't even contribute to the uh, the face of the man on the moon, whereas Imbrium uh, very prominently forms the man on the moon's left eye. Now, the action on Imbrium is primarily around the rim. Uh, we've got Plato Crater up at the top, uh, the gash of the Alpine Valley going through the Alps Mountains, Cassini Crater, the unusual little, uh, um, it looks like a bird's nest with two eggs in it. Uh, Archimedes Crater, the Apennine Mountains, arching on down to uh, Eratosthenes Crater, and then of course, Ty uh, Copernicus Crater, just south of Mare Imbrium, but its splash of rays so huge that it, the rays splatter out onto southern uh, uh, Mare Imbrium as well. 
Now, it's a fairly well bordered maria, and that's because the rim of the Imbrium impact basin, the original basin on the moon blasted out by an asteroid almost uh, about uh, 3.85 billion years ago, um, this is the rim of it. And a basin is nothing but a gigantic crater, um, almost 800 kilometers in diameter in this case. So it's no longer classified as a crater, we'll call it a basin. But the rim of it is what forms these mountain chains around the rim of the moon, uh, around, around the rim of uh, uh, Mare Imbrium, the Alps Mountains at the top, the Caucasus on the uh, uh, northeast, the uh, Apennines to the southeast, and then the um, Carpathians uh, separating um, Copernicus Crater from the body of um, Mare Imbrium. Um, not too many large craters in Mare Imbrium. Uh, um, Archimedes being the largest over here in the east, um, Timocharis and Lambert, um, moderate-sized craters, um, noticeable only because they're so isolated out on this vast empty plain of uh, Mare Imbrium, and then up uh, further north, uh, um, two smaller craters at the mouth of um, Sinus Aridum, and we'll investigate that here shortly if we go the right direction. Oh, come on. There we go. Uh, now we're looking a little bit more closely at the northeast side of uh, Mare Imbrium. Um, Plato Crater just lapping at the shoreline. And uh, in this sunset view, uh, the shadows and sunlight emphasize the mountains, uh, the Alps Mountains um, on, the, on the northeast, the uh, Caucasus on the east, the beginnings of the uh, Apennines arcing southward, and um, Archimedes Crater. Uh, similar to Plato in that it is lava filled. It is uh, uh, completely paved over inside. And they both cre were created, or, or in the, their interiors were, were created by a similar process, not by lavas overflowing the edge of the crater and spilling into it, but pushing up from underneath and flooding it from inside. Um, Tycho, oh, Plato crater up in the north, uh, the basalt is about 600 meters higher than the basalts of Mare Imbrium. Uh, the uh, basalts within Archimedes are not quite so high, uh, more more closer to the uh, the level of the, uh, of the surrounding Maria. Uh, a curious thing is these three craters here, uh, right in the center of it is a feature we call Sinus Lunicus. And that is named after the Russian Luna 2 spacecraft that impacted this area in September of 1959, the first spacecraft from Earth to arrive at the moon. Uh, so right in this area is where it all began, the space program, the space race to get to the moon um, was initiated. Uh, the Russians reached the moon in September of 59. Uh, we started the scientific push to also go to the moon and ultimately ended up with Apollo. Uh, let's move on a little bit further below wow. uh, um, the um, Sinus Lunicus up here on, uh, on the upper left. Uh, we see the beginnings of the Apennine Mountains and the snake like rill of um, Rama Hadley, Hadley Rill. This is the Apollo 15 landing site back in 1972 and uh, a mere 13 years after Luna 2 crashed into the moon deliberately. It was not supposed to land. It was an impactor. Uh, crashed here 13 years later. Dave Scott and Jim Irwin are walking on the moon uh, just south of that region. Uh, this is Mari Imbrium up here on the uh, upper left. Uh, then through this, this strait in the mountains, uh, we enter into uh, Mari Serenitatis, uh, the Sea of Serenity, uh, a part of which forms the man of the moon's right eye. And moving along a little closer. These, uh, uh, Robert, I, I have to tell you, all of these images are just breathtaking. I mean, well, they're just amazing. Well, thank, I, I would thank love you. I to see them like six foot by eight foot on my wall here. You know? Well, I, I routinely print many of these up to uh, 13 by uh, uh, 19. Mm. 
I'll have to get one from you sometime. Oh, yeah. I'd love to send you some. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Wow. Spectacular. I also hear you have a good book on, on the moon. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, uh, you'll get the 10 penny commercial when we get a few more slides okay. in here. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if, if you do enjoy the moon, if you like what you see here, if you know somebody who's enthralled with the moon, uh, think about them at Christmas time and uh, I'll show you a real good book that you can give them. That's but right. in the meantime, here are more, more of a close up of the uh, um, Apollo 15 landing site, uh, the first true science mission where they stayed for three days and deployed the lunar rover and buggied all around that area and uh, uh, went right up to the very edge of uh, Hadley Reel. And this was all done on live television. Um, I, I remember watching enthralled as, as each science stop they realigned the antenna on the uh, on the lunar rover back toward earth and we received a live television of their explorations hmm. so uh, it, it was really quite a time uh, scooting further down the apennine mountains uh we said if the apennine mountains were put on the moon for one reason it was to point like a finger toward eratosthenes crater and copernicus crater down here copernicus isn't technically in mari imbrium but uh, close enough that it has quite an effect on on uh, Imbrium. We see the, the spray of secondary craters splashed off even across the uh, uh, Carpathian Mountains and into uh, southern um, Mare Imbrium. And uh, now a close-up of those Carpathian Mountains down wow. on the southern edge. Um, and that's, of course, Copernicus Crater um, at sundown. And... Uh, Looking at the, uh, well, this more or less how central Imbrium probably looks tonight or early in the morning uh, with the sun, sunrise just stretching across it. Plato Crater at the top, just breaking into sunrise. Uh, Ar Ar uh, Archimedes at the bottom. Uh, the Spitzbergen Mountains poking up right here. Um, the uh, Mons Pico. Uh, Python is just off the edge there, but... Uh, Right there where my cursor is circling, that little feature looks like a hammer. It's a um, little mountain range, T-shaped mountain range. I call that Thor's hammer because it looks very much like Mjolnir, uh, the Norse god Thor's magic hammer. Mm. Um, but the curiosity in this image is this sweeping wrinkle ridge arcing down uh, from south of Plato Crater, getting down to the Spitsbergens, arcing off to the west. And then we pick up at the next picture. Uh, this is Western Mare Imbrium. Here, wrinkle ridges arcing up uh, offshore, Dorsum Heim, uh, the big fat one here, casting a shadow. Uh, this is uh, indicative of a buried basin impact ring underneath the, uh, the basalts, forcing up, uh, buckling up these wrinkle ridges. And then of course, uh, Sinus Eridum, uh, rather large uh, impact crater, basin that formed on the edge of Maria uh, of the of the um, Imbrium basin and in turn flooded with Mari basalts to uh, become a horseshoe bay. Now if this crater uh, this impact had occurred a little bit further west and not merged with Mari Imbrium, it would have created one of the largest craters on the near side of the moon. And uh, look how the wrinkle ridges look like frozen ocean waves washing into this horseshoe bay. And a bit of a close-up of Sinus Eridum itself. The Sinus Eridum translates as the Bay of Rainbows, which is uh, very uh, uh, prophetic because we're next to the uh, ocean, uh, the, the the Sea of Rain, Mare Imbrium. Um, Mare Fregoris arcing northward, portions of Oceanus Procellarum beginning to appear on the uh, um, Sunrise Terminator. Uh, the western side of Mare Imbrium has no defined border like the eastern side where we saw all the mountain ranges. Uh, it merges seamlessly into uh, uh, Oceanus Procellarum. 
So moving a little bit further along and off the beaten trail, uh, this is actually related to Mari Imbrium. This is the final slide. Um, even though we're now in territory uh, well to the west, or no, excuse me, well to the east and south, uh, you recognize uh, Ptolemaeus, or his actual um, 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 Alphonsus in the middle, or his actual at the bottom. Um, these are landmark craters in their own right and not associated with Mare Imbrium. But what is, is see the vertical gouges running the streaks ripped like cat claws uh, scratches uh, through the crater rims. Uh, this is what we call the Imbrium sculpture. Uh, these are clues that uh, back in the late 1800s uh, let the uh, chief geologist of the uh, uh, U.S. Geological Survey uh, to conclude that the Imbrium, uh, Mare Imbrium, the, the, the basin uh, cradling it, was created by a massive explosion. And it hurled chunks of material, mountain-sized blocks in all directions. And we can see uh, in this picture splashing across the crater rims where, where this debris tumbling across the face of the moon literally ripped gouges in the face of the moon. So uh, uh, this is all um, evidence pointing to how the lunar basins were formed by gigantic asteroid impacts. So getting to the end, I always say there is much to love on the moon. The moon is my playground, and I invite you to come out and play with me. And uh, you can do so by going to Amazon and uh, doing a title search, exploring the moon with Robert Reeves. My name is in the title specifically to differentiate this book from all the other books called Exploring the Moon. And uh, it can be on your doorstep in two days. So uh, I hope you'll get a copy and uh, go from a lunar novice to a lunar authority in 300 pages. So uh, I have enjoyed very much uh, visiting with you. I will stop the screen share if I can. Here it is. And uh, say thank you for letting me join you again. And uh... OK. All right. Well, that's great. Um, we uh, um, are coming up against um, our next speaker, uh, Maxi Folares uh, in Argentina. I think he's finishing up dinner, though. <laughs> so I think what we're going to do <laughs> is we're going to take a 10 minute break here and then we'll come back with Maxi, uh, who should be ready to uh, to log in at that time. But Robert, thanks again for sharing all your insights and stuff about the moon. Uh, you know, the, it is. Um, you know, they, they should have a regular television show or you know, a series of documentaries where you uh, you get on and describe uh, you know, each, each, uh, section of the moon and I would love the that. Way that you can, I mean, it's just, it's, it is really uh, a privilege. So well, actually I'm doing two radio shows this weekend, ju doing just that, except by radio. It's, I have by to radio. do it, for, it's hard to show to do the, it by verbal. Image, you're stunning yeah. images by radio. <laughs> yeah. Well, either way, it's I have a face fun. made for radio, but you know, so anyhow. <laughs> yeah. I know the feeling. <laughs> Thank you very much, Robert. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye -bye. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, yes, uh, we will, we're going to go ahead and take that 10 minute break right now and we'll come back with Maxi Filari's, uh, uh, where he's going to show some, uh, images of Jupiter. So stay tuned.
There we go. Unmute myself. <laughs> Anyways, uh, welcome back to the 136th Global Star Party. Uh, the size of the universe is the theme, and we had uh, we've had some amazing uh, uh, talks and lectures, uh, starting with um, uh, David Levy's introduction of Bart Bach, who gave a 30-minute uh, long lecture about the size of the universe. Um, uh, you know and uh, uh, also with uh, David Eicher, Deep T. Gautam, uh, Robert Reeves. Uh, I'm missing some people here already, uh, but um, Don Nav was on. Uh, uh, and uh, we are now going to Maxi Falaris uh, down in Argentina, who's been concentrating on the biggest uh, planet in our solar system, Jupiter. Maxi. Uh, thanks for coming on to Global Star Party, and I'm sorry to interrupt your dinner. No, hey, Scott. Hello. Good night, everyone. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I just have dinner, so, well, <laughs> I'm full right now. Good. But, well, like, like you say, Scott, I was, uh, we are in the planetary season, so I I could buy a, a new uh, camera that uh, gives you a little bit more details that I had with the uh, dedicated as astrophotography camera to deep sky objects. So in this case, it's, it's a planetary camera. It's a CWO662. A color. And the size of the pixel is more th small than the another one. So it will give me a more sharpless details on on what I'm going to or what I want to uh, capture. In this case, I work with the eight inches uh, f6 and a value the three x. But let me share my screen so you can see what I was doing. Uh, let me close this one and this one. Yeah. Okay. Do you see it? Yes. Great. Well, basically, uh, this was last uh, last Sunday night. Here's my Dobsonian scope on about the equatorial mount. But here's the astro camera. I'm pointing to, in this case, it's Jupiter right there. And there's the, the almost the highest point that I will get from here. <laughs> so it's almost 40 degrees above the horizon. So it's pretty low, pretty good. but oh, it's still low. anyway, true. yeah. And, and I think in two, in 2030, in a couple of years, it's going to be rising again, more higher in the, in my Senate. So, I have to give the chance now, so because more later I think it's going to be more low than this. But anyway, I uh, grab my equipment outside, put the, the scope and everything, and point to the because I want to capture the great red spot. Uh, but uh, it was more like it was coming from here and at that time. So I said everything and start to doing videos of one minute each other and i did almost uh, like you can see 146 videos of one minute so almost two hours and a half but between someone uh, i stopped of recording because the the scene it wasn't perfect but at the most precious time I had the most, the very most scene that I ever had till last night. So when I get all these videos, I process this in PIPP, it's a, a free software to to uh, not buyer the the buyer the the sensor and and get all the, the, the structure of Jupiter gets centered. So then I went to Autostackard 
uh, this version is the last one in in beta, but it works really fine. Uh, this is the 4.0.2 version. And this is an example of uh, what I get. This is only one video that you can see. It's almost, almost kind of, of stable, but then if I go more beyond, it's more rough. So I only, uh, I did in this video uh, 11,340 frames but only I stuck the 4% of that. So when I do this, I get this result, for example. Um, this is what the three zero oh, here. Uh, three zero is zero one. Yeah, this is the one. So if I open it, you can see uh, Jupiter very circularly, some details, but it's uh, very blurry. So I went to another software that called Registax. This is, I think, an old one, but it works really, uh, really okay, and it's free, <laughs> you know. And you you have only to put there. And then start to practice with the wavelets, okay? Because that it will going to give you more fine details or more gross details. So I was practicing, changing, seeing what I what what I like to to get to not to do too much because it will going to be awful. So I saved the, the last uh, set and you can see how, how it's going to change. And when I see this, I say, okay, I have a lot of details and I have to stack every single video to, to get more uh, and more uh, details. But remember one thing, like us, or in planet Earth, Jupiter has a rotation. So the planet, uh, one day in Jupiter is uh, are nine hours from us. So rotates really fast. So in every single minute, I have a lot of changes of position. So for example, I I did this, well, I, I, I didn't yet, but didn't do it yet, but you can see here is Jupiter. And when I get play, I'm going to show you the the all, almost the video that I did. That how fast in every frame Jupiter rotates. So it's if I stack everything, I will have I will have it everything um uh, straight and without focus and like movement. So well, in here, in this case, I have Io uh, passing by uh, in, in occultation by Jupiter, you can see. Wow. It's going there and then cool. it, it disappeared. So, and then I, when I did this, it was almost two and a half AM and it was really low and I say, okay, that's it. That's all for tonight. I uh, put, uh, I grab my equipment inside again, but I had to process everything. So I uh, wait for the another day, uh, seeing how it works and what the 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 frame wa was the the best to to get stuck in this case. So for, in, in this case, I work with Winshupos to measure. The, the size of the planet. And of course, if I get le less zoom, uh, for example, uh, and he, uh, I was outside. Uh, for example, in this one here, you can see there's this circle, this IO that it doesn't see on the field of view, 
but if I open another that is seed, there it is. So this will help you to get more centered and say of the position of where you are. In this case, I'm minus 60 degrees uh, in longitude, but latitude minus 34 because I'm in, in the southern hemisphere. And well, uh, the video uh, does the the time and the data in UTC. So I, you only have to measure every single frame to, well, I do a, a blocks of 10 frames and I did a one, two, three, four, five, six, in this case was uh, 60 frames. But the best ones was in the second and in the fourth uh, group of frames. So when I stack those, in this case, in when I go to the rotation, I add the the objects. Uh, let me find it. The row, uh, for example, I will do all these ones, I will open it. So if I open someone, you you see the measure, the measuring of the of the planets. If I go to the next one, it's going to be in the the, in the another position. And then the software we're going to do is a get in a, a promedy of all the videos to get in this case a, a position like it was in uh, 3 and 06 a.m. UTC, but I started to record this at 0301 and finished to 0311. So it's in the middle, we'll have the, the result. So, for example, if I go this, I create a new file where I want to get the, the result uh, saved. Uh, and then compile uh, pictures. You can see here is the, the rotation of 10 images and it is almost nine minutes. So here I have the, the rotation of those 10 frames in almost nine minutes. And then if I go to that file, it's going here, here, and open it here in Registax again, where I, in every single frame, I uh, work with the wavelets. When I put this, it will go to be more rough, more much more details, but because the sharpening is working with something that was sharpened before. Mm -hmm. So I have to uh, disincrease the, the volumes of the wavelets. So, I of course you have to start again to see what I get where you can get of more fine details, and I find in this one it's more fine details, but you can see almost the the, the great red spot and everything. Don't worry of the colors because uh, in this case it's like a greenish color or bluish color. But when you get a RGB balance, because the, way, uh, the white balance, it changed. So don't worry about it. Uh, so what I did, it was stack the, the, the better second group frames and the uh, better fourth group uh, frames. And the result was uh, here best. And um, here it was the. It's practically you can see here the, again the same problem. I have it. I'm I'm sharpening something that was sharpened before, so I have to this increase again. So when I get this, you can see over well, here that the great red spot is in the middle, and. I have the, the core the core and the nucleus uh, really there 
and, and the shape of the clouds going fine. Don't worry about these lines because in the edition you can put it out. And the result of that was this image uh, here, the T, yeah. Here's the final result. Of course, I changed the position because I like to put it in that position. But you can see here the, the core is more uh, colored. I work with the, try to not get too much focus because the noise, it will going to grow. So you have to balance everything to get more, uh, a, a picture more nature of of what it is. Don't get too, too much further. So, well, I was, uh, yeah, try to um, do it five or six times <laughs> again and again and again. It's like an obsession, you know, but when you get this result, because I think I never had it. Uh, when I started only with a cell phone, I could get the details with another scopes and everything. Also, when I get the F4 telescope and the dedicated camera, I have those. But uh, these kind of details, uh, I could never get it. Uh, let me open it here. Here's without too much color. So what I get was uh, get a, a, a light a luminance frame to put it uh, like a mask and then work with the colors. If I uh, increase the, the saturation, you can see how color is going to increase. So I put it and then I think uh, if I put this another one, it's going to be really, really tough. So I would put it less to get yeah I, I like it that way and that puts a little more contrast so basically it's practicing with everything and and well uh, you know it's perseverance because I I don't have the good uh, weather uh, uh, pronostics because it, I have a lot of wind, but I had this well, window beautiful. of of one hour, yeah, and the the the, the stabilization of the of the of the scene was incredible. I could see some details uh, going through, so I had to give a chance. So well. Uh, this is what I was what I was doing these couple of days. I I was uh, a little off of doing deep sky objects, and I was working a little more with planetary. But like I said, here is more difficult for the angle of the altitude of the object. So it's I it's not like the lottery, but some kind of. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope someday I can win the lottery. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hope you can too. That's great. Okay. Well, All right. Well, thank you so much, Maxi. That's that's wonderful. No, thank and, you. Um, uh, you know, I can imagine your planetary work will get uh, better and better, but uh, um, then then you'll be competing against. Uh, the likes of people like Damien Peach and uh, no, it's, oh, yeah, but, you just never know, you know. So. Uh, yeah, I I think I, I don't like to say it's competition because every every single or every each astrophotographer has the their way to work and True. every every work uh, depends of uh, is more subjective than objective so uh Daniel Peach has uh, of course the equipment and the skies and the knowledge and the, the experience 
of course he exactly i i i never i never could talk with him but i hope someday like with christopher go or uh, eric sosenbach that sure. i think is australian but uh, there are a lot of reference that they do that you can say okay i could get there if they could i could get there but of course the equipment also sometimes give you some uh, some limits so you have to spring that lemon to get all kind of juice but it has a limit so you don't have to worry to get all the more fine details of the perfection no you are doing astrophotography and and doing science with that for example if in this case uh, i record videos to get all these frames but remember one thing the this is our uh, sort of system. This is our neighborhood, basically. So in Japan, a couple of weeks ago, they captured the the flare of the impact in Jupiter. Of course, that's amazing. And sure. you do that when you are doing this kind of stuff uh, because you are recording videos to get pictures of Jupiter doing pictures, but you maybe have that lucky. And of course, when you have the uh, the the transition of of uh, a moon passing in front of Jupiter, on this case behind of that, is still astronomy because you can demonstrate that we are not only ones that moves in the sky; it's everything moving. So, in a small scale, but in a huge scale, also. <laughs> That's true. At unbelievable mm -hmm. speeds. Maxi, thanks very much. And, uh, nice work, you. Maxi. Beautiful <laughs> work. You, yeah, it's great stuff. <laughs> Those colors popped when you uh, did that that one color change where it white balanced out. You could see instantly yeah. the amazing colors that you captured. Yeah, that's why you don't have to worry. I worry because I I I, I worry when I say those or what is green or what is like yellow yeah. but it's the white balance so it will going to you can change it don't worry about it it's excellent very nice okay. actually as usual as usual well, thank you guys thanks so much. thank you guys good night bye good night. bye bye okay um coming up next is um uh robert or bob fugate um Bob has been on several Global Star Parties, uh, but he, it's been a few months since he's been on, so we're really happy to have him back. Um, he is, uh, of course, uh, of, uh, someone of uh, adaptive optics uh, and uh, laser-guided uh, uh, artificial star fame, um, and he's done much for the advancement of the science of astronomy. Uh, but he's also an amateur astronomer and a fantastic astrophotographer, and he has uh, agreed to come on and show us some of his latest work. Thanks for coming on to Global Star Party, Bob. Okay, thanks, Scott. Um, Thank you. It's been, uh, it's been a while, as you say, and uh, I'm just kind of blown away with all of the presentations tonight. It's really, really a great party. Yes, and. Sir. Um, Thanks so much for putting it all together. Thank you. Thanks for Let's being here. Let's see if I can too. see if I can share my screen. Um, and get the presentation started here. Does that look like it's working? Yes. Yep. You're in presentation mode. Okay. Um, I guess I'd like to get rid of this gizmo at the top here, but I'm not quite sure how to do that. Um, okay. Um, we don't see, see anything but the slide. So, right. But, the problem yeah. is it's kind of kind of blocking my view. I see. I, I can move it down a little bit. Sure. I think there's a way to turn it off, but um, not sure where it is. I'm not much of a... Um, Zoom it, Ranger. It it looks just fine. It looks okay. just fine. 
So as some of you may remember or know, I now live in Phoenix, which is kind of um, in the middle of a super white zone. And uh, my sky quality meter typically reads 17.8. So I'm I'm eager to, I, I, I have been trying narrow band, of course, and um, have had some success with that, but I'm eager to get out when I can and um, see uh, where, where I can go and find um, uh, other locations. So back in June, um, I went to the White Mountains uh, east of Payson, Arizona with a friend. We rented a cabin there and um, we um, uh, spent a few nights and my my primary instrument is the Takahashi Epsilon 160ED. It's a hyperbolic Newtonian, and it it has incredible optical quality as long as you can get your camera square to the to the optical axis and at the right focal distance from the coma corrector. Um, it doesn't have a very good focuser, and so I replaced it. I've replaced the stock focuser and um, I've been using the Pegasus rotator because ultimately I'd like to set this telescope up as a remote telescope and operate it uh, remotely. And for doing that, and in order to make good compositions, I need to be able to rotate the camera. Mm -hmm. However, the rotator does tend to add some tilt. so. Um, that's an area of concern. And I'm using chroma filters in a ZWO filter wheel. Um, and I also have a device that allows me to position the camera uh, in order to get, get it square to the optical axis. The camera is the full frame ZWO 6200 uh, mono camera. And in order to make it portable, I'm I'm trying the uh, one of the new Strainwave drive mounts. Uh, this one is the Ioptron. It's very similar to um, the ZWO AM5 in terms of its capabilities. Uh, this one has encoders and um, to help with uh, the periodic error and and with guiding. And I run the whole a whole rig off of a lithium iron phosphate battery, uh, which lasts actually a couple of days. Mm. So um, in that expedition to the White Mountains, I was able to get what most consider a very difficult target. This is the um, flying bat and squid. Um, OU4 is the squid. And this was um, nine hours of total integration, but seven hours on O3 alone. Mm. So this is this is a very difficult target. I was quite pleased that um, the um, setup allowed me to get what I consider to be a pretty good image. Uh, yeah. In um, in August. Um, I went to the Gila National Forest. I have a friend who has a cabin there that's embedded in the forest and land withdrawn from the forest. And um, this is a really incredible site. It's very, very dark. Um, so in this exposure is a 40 millimeter uh, lens on a DSLR and um, the exposures for the meteors were two minutes each, and um, the exposure for the landscape was 15 minutes. So um, in order to get enough light on the landscape, mostly from the Milky Way, that's how long an exposure I had to make. And wow. it's one of those places where you're stumbling around in the dark even after 45 minutes. 
There's a couple of smoke trails in the image. Uh, there's one here that's very noticeable. And um, I was with a few friends, of course, and I probably missed quite a few meteors due to my inattention and drinking beer and, and having a great time looking at the night sky. Awesome. So then in October, I traveled again to New Mexico to uh, Magdalena. And um, as a sort of adjunct member of the Magdalena Astronomical Society, um, a group of us went to the edge of the uh, eclipse path. Uh, it's an an it was an annual eclipse, of course. And the idea was to try to maximize Bailey's beads. Uh, so this was the group that drove over a very rough road um, for quite some distance to get to this location. And this was my setup. I had a um, Nikon camera, a, a 2X extender on a 400 millimeter F 2.8 lens on my Ioptron HEM 44 mount. And, um, and my trusty lithium battery. And so I just did a rough uh, polar alignment using my using my cell phone, um, and uh, for the short durations of the exposures and so forth, it worked out quite well. So um, this is kind of what the field looked like, and I was shooting. Um, I was shooting um, exposures rapidly so that I could put a movie together of the encounter. And here is that movie. Um, you can see the first pull away of the moon oh, from wow. the edge of the sun. And then as it approaches again, just literally seconds later. Um, so that was... Um, that was quite exciting to watch and cool. to record. So um, shortly after that, in the next days that followed, um, the Magdalena Astronomical Society sponsor a star party every year called the Enchanted Skies Star Party. It's in Pie Town, New Mexico, which is west of Magdalena, about an hour drive and uh, sort of a hotbed for astrophotography and astronomy these days. And one of, the, one of the people there, one of the astronomers there has a 40 inch Dobsonian. And uh, we got a private tour uh, during the star party. And here he is looking, um, getting things lined up and ready for the night observation. It's the largest Dobsonian I've ever looked through. And uh, things are very, very bright can see quite quite a lot of depth. And on the way to Pie Town, we nearly were run over by a radio telescope. Uh, <laughs> as some of you may know, on Route 60, you drive right by the VLA. And uh, they happened to be moving one of the telescopes along the, the railroad tracks. And it it moves along at a pretty good clip. And um, and I'm I'm not sure what the protocol is because we were able to get by you can see how close it was to the road there when we approached it. And uh, so that was kind of exciting. So after the star party, um, I returned to Magdalena to a location where I'm, where I'm anticipating the possibility of setting up my telescope as a remote one. And I just wanted to do some test exposures to see, you know, what, what, it, what the sky might be like. So this was my setup. And I spent two nights uh, making, um, uh, taking some images. And the object I looked at was VDB 152 called the Wolf's Cave Nebula. It's a fairly popular object. And um, from David's talk tonight, I, I plotted on here the object he was discussing, uh, Pismus Marino 1. And they're very close together in the sky, actually. And but I think it's very small compared to what I was looking at. So with my short focal length telescope, I probably couldn't do very well. But I might uh, look into that a little further and 
and give it a try. It's very a very interesting object. So at any rate, here's VDB 152. Um, this is um, eight hours and 30 minutes um, of ex total exposure. And it's um, most of the filters L, R, G, and B plus hydrogen alpha. And uh, this, this part of the sky and Cepheus in general is just loaded with stuff. So uh, dust and nebulae and um, re both reflection and emission, lots of streaks of hydrogen alpha. Um, so it's quite an interesting part of the sky. So I, I um, zoomed in a little bit here. We'll look at the middle first and um, the dust and reflection um, and background of hydrogen alpha, this this bit of dust down here, um, these bright stars in the neighborhood, it's just gorgeous. And as David had mentioned, the sky is just littered with stars. Wow. I mean, they're everywhere in this, you know, because we're right at the edge of the Milky Way. And here's the upper part of the image. Um, this this part here is LBN 538. And this object, I'm not really sure about. It was first thought to be a planetary nebula, but I don't think it's considered to be that anymore. And more hydrogen alpha here. Just really gorgeous stuff to look at. And then in the upper left, we have LBN 532 and LDN 1221. And this is a very dark uh, dust region with lots of trailing dust. Again, more hydrogen alpha. And then in the lower right part of the image, we see all this dust that is in wispy like clouds. Just, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of uh, hopeless because I just like driving around in these images and looking at stuff for, you know, literally hours and just trying to see what I can find and see in them. It's just really, really gorgeous part of the sky. So in November, uh, I changed up my rig a little bit in trying to get it more balanced. Um, I've always used this counterweight. Um, the strain wave gear folks say, you should put a counterweight on if you're going to exceed 44 pounds. Uh, this rig weighs about 42 pounds, believe it or not, mostly because of these very heavy rings, which I have recently replaced. Uh, the two rings weigh nearly 10 pounds. But the big problem is that most of the weight is far from the axis of rotation way down here in right ascension. And that generates a large moment. And um, it probably is stressing the specification of about 20 Newton meters or 40 Newton meters uh, for this particular mount. So one of the things I did was I tried to rotate um, this big globule of mass that consists of the optical train to get it lower in the um, you know, closer to the axis, and also put my guide scope down on the side here. And uh, another view of that is shown here, where I'm, uh, again, trying to lower the center of mass of the arrangement. And, um, but what, what I learned in when I went to my next location, which is Mule Creek, New Mexico, um, the the temperature got quite low down to 12 degrees Fahrenheit minus 11 C. And the spec for the mount is minus 20 C. But when when it came time to do, um, when it came time to do the Meridian flip at transit, uh, the mount would not lift the telescope over to do the flip. So I was quite surprised. And 
my friend who was with me had an AM5. His did the same thing. It would not do a meridian flip, even though, hmm. even though it's within the, maybe barely within the spec. So um, that's um, a little concerning, and I'm doing more investigation on that and um, discussing this some with Ioptron. So here was our setup. Uh, there were three of us who rented uh, a cabin there. And this cabin is on a, a lady's ranch. Um, she has 440 acres, which she says is nothing because across the street, her neighbor, his ranch, is measured in square miles, five miles by 27 miles. Wow. And he has cattle on the ranch, uh, one, one cow per 40 acres. So that will support a lot of cows, apparently. But um, this, is, this is a stargazer's paradise because, as you can see, like in the Gila, this is just south of the Gila National Forest. Uh, in wet, far western New Mexico, and um, it's the sky is very pristine and um, dark. So this was our setup. We had uh, telescopes on this side of the driveway, and I was set up over here. The green light came from a pilot light on a power supply that was sitting beside the wall here. And even though it wasn't very bright to us visually, you know, in a in a 30 second exposure in your camera, it does show up. So here's a time lapse. This is 11 hours. Uh, you can see us running around and every, occasionally a light go on. We come out with our headlights on. If you watch closely, you'll watch, you'll see meridian flips on these telescopes. They happen very quickly because um, it's such a long time lapse. This is 11 hours and 55 seconds. Well, 11 hours displayed in 55 seconds. There was when I had the problem with the meridian flip. There was a meridian flip over here. And um, here's the Big Dipper, the handle of it anyway. The North Star is here. Here's daytime, and then it clouded up in the early morning. So the clouds waited till morning, and we, we lucked out. So the other thing I did with these um, exposures was I made a star trail image. Um, so this is what happens when you put 10.8 hours of 30 wow. second exposures that's 1,300 exposures together in Photoshop. That's beautiful. And um, all the colorful lights, and the, you can see the telescopes flipping over, and pretty cool. So here is one of the images. This is IC348 in Perseus. Um, this is the IC348 region here. This I call a dusty inferno because the uh, hydrogen alpha that's being lit up here, probably by this star, ATIC. Um, this is a 3.8 magnitude uh, blue giant. And of course, it's very bright and really lights up the region here. So I've zoomed in some on this. Um, Here's the, neb the the reflection nebulosity of IC348. I couldn't find a specific designation for the H alpha region uh, or the dust here. And if we look at some of the details in the reflection nebula, it's just amazing. Not sure what's going on right here. And here's the hydrogen alpha inferno with, um, and you can you can see it through the dust even. Very cool. Yeah, this is beautiful. 
And then the other target I shot was NGC 1333, which is just nearby. That's this object here. And it's just loaded with dust. Uh, it's just everywhere. Uh, this is eight hours and 30 minutes. And here is here it is at 100% um, NGC 1333. This is some sort of H alpha emission. Again, some very dense dust. And um, the lower right part with more reflection nebula, very intricate and complex patterns in the dust. I imagine Bart Bach would just be mesmerized by these. Yeah, things. yeah. It's, you know, we, we live in such a great time because with relatively simple equipment, we can see this sort of thing in one night. And it's just, it's just totally mind blowing to me. So um, that's what I had to report on my recent adventures with, uh, uh, let's see what's happened here. Uh, you're, uh, did I stop you, sharing? You stopped sharing. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Uh, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, uh, Bob, uh, you know, uh, we hope to see you again on a future Global Star Party. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Okay. So um, up next is uh, Marcello Souza uh, down in Brazil. Uh, uh, Marcello as I've mentioned on many, a global star party is the editor of, uh, of Skies Up magazine. He is the founder of the Louis Cruz uh, Astronomical Society down in Brazil. And uh, uh, he is um, a force to be reckoned with in astronomy outreach in uh, South America. In fact, in the world, he's had amazing uh, events uh, where uh, thousands of people come together to witness uh, the celestial mechanics of uh, eclipses and, um, uh, you know, uh, comets and all kinds of things. I, I think that the most um, memorable uh, 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 presentation he's given, though, was one where uh, a farmer had found a meteor or actually witnessed a meteor fall and found the meteorite, okay? So uh, really amazing. And uh, so uh, Marcello's been at this for quite some time, uh, you know, uh, popularizing astronomy, teaching young people uh, about uh, the universe and getting people young and, all, and old involved in uh, learning more about science. Marcello, thank you for coming on to Global Star Party and I'll give you the stage. Thank you for the invitation, Scott. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. And uh, today I have also a special week yeah? uh, because uh, this week we are also celebrate the born of uh, Edwin Hubble. Yeah? I'll share my screen. Okay, here. Yeah. Let me see if you work here, bro. Mm. One moment. Ah, okay. This is uh, 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 the most famous uh, uh, poetry in Portuguese. That is Fernando Pessoa. That's a Portuguese. Uh, for us, it's like Shakespeare for you in, in English. No? It's a very famous poetry. And uh, he wrote as an, with another name, Alberto Caeiro, the uh, a poem that's very famous here is he said this: "The universe is not my idea. My idea of the universe is that it is my idea. Yeah? Is what we are doing yeah? when we study the universe. Yeah, is I don't know if it, it, it's the same problem that I have with Shakespeare in Portuguese. Maybe if you read the the text written by Fernando Pessoa in English, because he wrote in Portuguese. Né? 
Man, I don't know if he had the same impact that we had, you had. But it, it is very famous one. He has very famous point. And I, I will talk something, some about some contributions for the model that you have about the universe expansion. Thomas Wright, uh, I, Galileo with the telescope saw that he, the first, first time in that and reports you know, that have so many stars in the Milky Way. But Thomas Wright was the first person that imagined uh, our galaxy. You know? He imagined this. You know? uh, he published this uh, original theory of new hypothesis of the universe. And in this book, he explained the appearance of the Milky Way as this one. An optical effect due, due to our immersion in what locally approximates to a flat layer of star. He imagined a thin layer, and we are inside this thin layer. Then when we look up and down, we see many uh, less stars when we look in the other directions. You see more stars. Then is a way to explain why we see the Milky Way only in a part of the sky. Né? It's because we are inside, looking inside a thin layer. Mm. Then it's something fantastic he imagine this. Né? And now, this is more about what he said. Né? The many cloudless spots is just perceivable by us as far without our star regions in which those visible and luminous space, no one star or particular constituent board can possibly be distinguished. It's a fantastic idea. Now, and with this idea that we begin to imagine that we live in a region with other stars, a region in the sky, our galaxy. And with this idea later, Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, the famous philosopher, that imagined that it's not only one region in the sky. We have another, maybe we have another region in the sky like this. If we imagine that is like a coin, right? then uh, we can have another region in, in the space like this. The idea that uh, the first way that he imagined the galaxies have how we know today. Né? Then he called Iceland universe. We have many different Iceland universe né? that are different points, like the one where you live né? in the same way. Né? This was proposed by Kent é, from the idea from original imagined by Thomas Wright. This is fantastic. Né? Herschel also né? Uh, uses this idea, he is, he, he, uh, how he imagined the Milky Way with the information that he had, brought uh, by William Herschel, and uh, everything changed with the contribution from two pairs. One is in here at Levit, uh, that she a fantastic astronomer, and they also she was very good in mathematics. He worked as a woman computer né? here with another woman, women né? in the past. He's a fantastic mathematics. And he, she was responsible for this theory. Oh, sorry. That she helped a lot Hubble. Né? She discovered in 1912 the relation between the intrinsic brightness and the period of safe variables. Then this is something that allows us to know the distance of this star from us. Because if you know a relation between the intrinsic brightness and we compare with the brightness that we see from the Earth, you can imagine the distance of this star. Then as a way to make it a uh, good measurements of the distance. Yeah? It's something that Hubble uses. Yeah? Then here, like this, yeah? here we have the brightness variation of delta Cephei. Yeah? is five and 
dot for days. And here you have the period luminosity relation for Cepheid variables here. And a result of a word knowing the period of the variation of the brightness of a Cepheid variable, it's possible to know the distance of the star. It's something fantastic. You know? uh, and now we have the Edwin Hubble in this short history you know, that I'm told. Uh, he was born in November 20th. Uh, yesterday, yeah. in 1889. And uh, here he is uh, uh, published by Mount Wilson Observatory in honor of uh, Edwin Hub. Uh, uh, he's born. And uh, what, uh, as we are talking about the size of the universe, you need to... Uh, here is uh, an image analyzed by Hubble, with the help of Humason, né? Milton Lassalle Humason, that's a fantastic history also. Uh, here you see here the Cepheid, where is my mouse? Here you can see the Cepheid variable, star, in this galaxy. Uh, they didn't know that it was a different galaxy. They imagined like a nebula né? inside the Milky Way. With the measurements made by Hubble about uh, using the Cepheid star, he measured the distance and he, he proved that the distance of this galaxy, Andromeda, from our galaxy was greater than the size of the Milky Way. Then it was another galaxy. And this was published in 1923 using the work originally developed by Henrietta Leavitt, yeah. using a Cepheid star. That's something fantastic. Yeah. Mm. And then, now we need, we have, we need, he needed the help of the spectroscopy. Yeah. That's a very important tool for astronomy. And uh, with this, we know the spectrum of elements. Uh, like hydrogen, oxygen, each element has a different spectrum. Of. Then what uh, Hubble did, uh, each chemical element has characteristic lines, and analyzing, analyzing the spectrum, we know the chemical composition and also the velocity of the stars from us. Uh, this is something fantastic. And uh, who was responsible with the results used by Hubble. Vesta Sliffer, that's that also born in November, né? 11 <laughs> November. Vesta Sliffer, he was the first person, né? he had an image that he analyzed, né? the first measurement of radio velocities for galaxies and discovered that distant galaxies are head shifted. Né? Very distant galaxies. Né? I had shifted. He discovered this first. He, he makes this measurement. He associates the velocity of the galaxies with the red shift. Né? This is a contribution made by this guy. Né? And Edwin Hubble, working with Milton Lassalle Hamilton, he discovered a proportionality between galaxies' distance and their head shifts. Then the galaxies more distance has a bigger head shift, and then he, he could uh, as a way to imagine how the universe is. And also uh, as a way that he, we, after his announcement, we can only consider the universe expanding well, because it, the galaxies, the galaxies that are very far from us are moving away from us. Then all the, if you look in different directions, all these galaxies that are very far from us are moving away from us. Then this means that the universe is expanding. That's a way uh, to then after this, uh, we had in the before 
models of a, a static universe. After the results published by Hubble, we begin to consider only models that consider that universe is expanding. Yeah. And, but uh, in our local group, you see here, uh, in local groups of galaxies, is most important the uh, gravitational fields. Then these galaxies is not uh, moving away. They are moving in the same one in direction of the other. The Andromeda galaxy is moving in direction of the Milky Way because the uh, gravitational field is stronger than the, the force that moves this galaxy to be distant one from another. Then I'm talking about the groups of galaxies or galaxies that are distant, more distant from us, far from us. And uh, here you have the expansion of the universe, this model, né? that will be return the idea uh, of uh, Thomas Wright. Né? Then we imagine that we are living in a layer, a thin layer, in a universe that's curved and is expanding in four dimensions. Né? It's something that returns this idea. And Gamov, based on the data initially presented by Hubble, put forward the hypothesis that the universe would have had a moment in the past with extremely high values for its density and energy. From that moment, the universe begins to expand, expand. Then is the idea that you have today of the Big Bang. Yeah. is the origin of this expansion of the universe. This is the model that you have today, né, that we, everybody knows né, about this kind of expansion. And you have two different moments. One is the first moment because it, it's not, it, this didn't come from the theory. You need to put with your hands there né, because it, it's not possible to have this solution from the theory, the gravitational theory of, from Einstein. Uh, is the inflation uh, uh, in a in the early universe in a short moment the universe expanded very fast and then begin to to expand in a different velocity and nowadays we know that he is expanding faster than we have in the, we predict in the theory and then now we need to consider another kind of force that is making the universe to expand faster. Then for our model of universe, this is the idea that you have the when you call the size of the universe and distance. We here are near us in the Earth. We have our solar system. We have in the nearby galaxies, stars in, in our galaxies. We have how the size of the Milky Way. We are talking about 100,000 light years né, of diameter. We have our local group that we are talking about two and a half, two and a half million light years. Our local group, the radio. Uh, we belong to a, a, a super cluster of galaxy of local groups here, the Virgo have local superclusters, and the, here is the idea of the observable universe that we know today. But what is fantastic is that uh, we, we don't know what is 95% of all the matter and energy of the universe. The, what we know, like... Uh, uh, matter like we, we have in our daily life is only uh, less than one uh, percent. Mm -hmm. We have in stars half of one percent, you know, matters and the uh, heavy elements is, 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 is only. Uh, 0.03% have elements from what we know of the universe. 
95%, 7% is associated with dark energy, 25%, almost 25%, with the dark matter that you have to consider to explain what happens with the rotation of the galaxy in the board, in the board of the galaxy. You know? And then it's something that we don't know. Then we have a job for astronomers for many years because most of the model of the universe we don't know what is. Then you know? we are looking far, but we don't know what's happening. You know? Then thank you very much for the attention, Scott. It's a very short history. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. you and a lot soon, of ground. And soon uh, we have a new edition of the Skies app. Uh, I yes. hope that after the Thanksgiving next week. Uh, and a happy Thanksgiving for everyone. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you much. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, no problem. We hope to have you uh, next time. So okay, nice. thanks so much. Okay, uh, our next speaker is none other than Dan Higgins of Astro World TV, and they're getting ready for the Astropalooza event. Dan, it's all yours. Hey, everybody! Can I? I'm sorry, my hair is a little bit of a mess, so I, I apologize. My, <laughs> I've been I've been going crazy here, so. Uh, uh, Scott, how's it going? Um, can you hear me? It's good. good. We've had a, a really interesting uh, Global Star Party, starting off with, um, um, you know, uh, Bart Bach, uh, who uh, gave his presentation in 1957. Thankfully, he recorded it so we could play it tonight, you know, so, um, but it was really interesting to, you know, all joking aside. Uh, to have David Levy, who got to know Bart Bach, um, Dave, David Iker also got to meet him through David Levy. And so just to have some, uh, that thread of, you know, people who knew someone that were uh, talking about who passed on in 1983. Um, he was a hard worker, from what I understand, he actually died at his desk. So, wow. Wow. Yeah. So uh, constantly studying the uh, universe, but unbelievable. Um, yeah, right. yeah. They'll, they'll, you know, I'm sure they'll be, they'll be us too. But um, sure. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm probably gonna <laughs> die. Uh, I'm gonna die to in this the, chair the, right here. That's what I'm gonna. Yeah, the groundbreaking <laughs> <laughs> breakthrough. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, uh, yeah. just yeah. So um, so are you are you are you excited about uh uh this event um that you got coming up is it um um is it becoming overwhelming or is it just a as do you love doing this i i, I loved i love doing this and you know what last year was i really didn't know what i was getting into i mean an eight hour plus event i time to be broadcasting. It, it's, it's a long time and thank god it wasn't you know you know, it, it kind of breaks up the monotony if you're hosting because, you know, you talk for 20 minutes and then somebody else talks for 20 minutes. And it goes back and forth. But let me tell you, um, we had some awesome guests last year. And uh, we had uh, Molly Wakeling, Sean Nielsen, Wayne Parker, Massive. We had everybody. And now, you know, it looks like it's getting a little bit more of, a, you know, this is only the second one we're doing. And, um, you know, now we have yourself. Trevor Jones, Dylan O'Donnell, Stacy Downton, Sean Nielsen, Masters of Pixar Insight again. Um, okay. I who else? Uh, Charles Bracken, Doctor Sass from my telescope is going to be on, and we got really good door prizes this year. I mean, uh, uh, this year Charles Bracken is giving us a uh, signed uh, autograph book of his, and uh, Doctor Whitby made a book uh, a couple years back called The Visible Universe. Uh, so okay. that is going to be a good prize. And not only that, but he is, I don't know if you've seen this picture and I, I don't have it on the page. I didn't even think I was going to bring it up, but it's an all sky picture. It has something of about 190 hours worth of wow. data over the entire world. And the Milky Way just goes like this and it's the whole sky. Wow. And it's a ridiculous way. He's giving us a, he showed it at, um, at NEAC last year 
And he's giving us one of those to give away as a door prize as well. It's a uh, print or it's a print. It's a print. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's huge. It's ridiculous. Um, wow. It's, it's, I think it's like three feet by two feet. I mean, it's like a banner. It's big. Beautiful. Um, Dr. Sass is giving us a premium image set from my telescope from, from one of his uh, chili scopes. So last okay. year, last year he gave us, um, what is it? Um, uh, what's that glob? Um, uh, uh, damn, I forgot. It's the biggest glob in the South. I've got uh, two, oh, two, uh, two, two canny, two forty seven. Was it two canny? Yeah, two forty. I think it was two forty seven. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think that was uh, not the biggest. Uh, Omega is definitely the biggest, but, but I mean, certainly a big one and a very bright one. You know, right? Very bright, very gold, and beautiful. it looks like a beautiful picture. Yeah. Um, um, also, uh, we're also doing, so one thing that we did last year, and I, I didn't mention this last week and I wanted to mention it this week. Um, we are selling, um, t-shirts, tour shirts, like for the show. So it has okay. Astropalooza on the front and on the back has a date and everybody that was on it and all of the, we did the same thing last year too. And I really didn't promote it as much as it's a, like a concert. Shirt. It's a concert right? shirt. Yeah. Okay. But here's the thing. All of the proceeds of the buying of these shirts go to a donation to an astronomy club somewhere in the world. So, and if you want to be involved in that, if you want your name on the list to be eligible, just email me at dan at astroworldtelescopes.com and okay. you could, I'll put you on the wheel. We have the spinning wheel that we do. If, you watch, if you've watched the show before, you know we do a lot of giveaways um and dan at astroworldtelescopes.com and just say i want to be on the list i'll put you on the list and we're going to give that check away uh on december 9th at astropalooza so okay. that's right. I, put, I put your email address there in chat so that they can uh participate in that and what what else uh as far as masters of pix insight also have given us a lot of free Masters of Pix Insight classes. So if you're interested in taking your um, image processing using Masters using Pix Insight sure. to the next level, you can yeah. get a class for free just by going to Astral Web. It's a different website, astralweb.com, and then you sign up for the Astropalooza Door Prize. Okay. We have about 50 people on that. On. If you want, if you want, Scott, I'll email you the information. It's going to be a, you know. I put the I put the link right there. In yep. the chat. Astroworldweb.com. Correct. Yep. Okay. Yep. And right. uh, who else is going to be on? Simon Lewis is going to be on. Wayne Parker is going to be on. It's going to be a lot of fun. It starts at two o'clock. You see it on the bottom, right? Right there, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Astropalooza two on December ninth. Yep. Two p.m. 2 p.m. start, and last time it was supposed to close out at 10 Eastern. It ended to be about 11, 11.30, and, you know, at the yeah, end of the show. Sometimes these things run a little bit long. Yeah, oh, but that's, that's cool. Yeah, that's live. Know. That's live TV. That's what happens. So That's right. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Come and hang out with us. We had over 2,000 people watching last year, uh, so we're hoping to break that this year. So come on, hang out with us, even if it's just for a little bit, whoever you want to watch. The schedule um, I'll email you the schedule there. I made the schedule okay. um, and you could put that on there and uh, everybody could see who's going to be on when, and it's sure. a tentative, tentative schedule for now, but it's pretty much solid, but uh, everyone's been, uh, been really gracious with their time. And then the presenter, it's going to be great. It's gonna be a great time. So come, come That's hang out. Great. That's wonderful. You know, uh, uh, more, um, more people in this business should be doing what you're doing, Dan. So I really appreciate the outreach, the education, the camaraderie that you guys have. You know, you show like the best side of what uh, amateur astronomy, our community of amateur astronomers is all about, you know. So uh, you share the, you know, all your secrets and uh, you guys don't have any secrets. I no. mean, you, you basically... <laughs> Well, we, 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 all, save, so. we save some we save some, some but, uh, but those are like <laughs> private things yeah. right it's i like mean what's, you know, it's so. like what's in the sauce in the big mac you know you're not going to share everything you know you you, you, you got to save a little bit you know you got to want That's them to come right. back for more but you know what it, it, it is all about the camera and i'll be dead honest with you i probably 
learn more from the people that are on the show in the chat and talking about the chat and pointing stuff out sure. live on the show than I probably relay on the show. So, I mean, we it, the, well, the, the chat sure. drives the entire show. We do shows every Wednesday and every Friday night, depending on if I'm traveling or whatever, because you know how it is, Scott. Oh, we're of all, course. We're yeah. all over the country. you got to travel sometimes. <laughs> so, so um, but uh, every Wednesday. It's not Friday, that we I, travel so that we don't do shows. I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah. so. Well, well Eric's right. been doing a good job doing the shows occasionally when I'm not able to direct them, like with all the, all the, pomp and circumstance that I like to do, but, uh, sure. um, you know, but Hey, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a great time. And, uh, you know, just come and hang out with some, some half decent people. That's right. <laughs> so. More than half, more than half <laughs> decent. So that's but wonderful. That, thank you, Scott, for letting me come on and, uh, and, uh, tout Ash. Hey, I hope everybody comes down. I appreciate anytime. it. I know we're you're running a late supporter of, uh, of what you do. And, uh, we're glad to, uh, share, um, uh, you know, these details with our audience. So, so hook yeah. with, Ast with uh, Astroworld TV, learn more about astrophotography. If you're not doing astrophotography, I don't know, why not? You know, you'll be amazed at what you can get. Uh, astrophotography is more advanced than ever, but it's also easier than ever. You yeah. Know? So, uh, and when you have people guiding you like these guys do at Astroworld TV, you're going to get the images of your dreams. So. I'm sorry. I, I got to say it. I'm going to be, I'm, I'm an honest person for those of you who don't know me. I hate you astro imagers of today. I hate you all because, because oh, you know what? <laughs> if we can get the same that image, you were, like, hiding, that you were repressing? <laughs> we can get the same image in 30 seconds that it took you five hours. Five hours. Well, that's we, called, that's called technology. That's called technology advancing. Some of your, some of the astrophotographers also said, you know what? This is crazy. Let's enjoy or figure something out so that more people will get into the hobby. Because remember, astronomy started out as mostly visual. You had to learn how to build a telescope or you had to do what John Schwartz do and draw your images. Yeah, that yeah, was astrophotography. Yeah. But now we're in a golden age where a lot of people coming into clubs. We did a survey at our club, Lowbrows. Most of them, over half, if not 60%, want to learn astrophotography or want to do more astrophotography. Yep. So that's where, now, the visual astronomy is still there. You can still do a lot with a pair of binoculars. But what you're doing, and John, I mean, there's two different sides. Everybody wants to capture their own version of what's going on in the sky. Absolutely. Or night. And, um, Absolutely. You know, you know it, and that, but that's it, where you come in. To, it's, to a point, love, it's a love-hate. It is a love-hate. It is a love-hate. I mean, I, I, I was, love them because oh, yeah. your, you love them, but you love to hate them. And I can see stuff <laughs> to add to my drawings, but I hate them because they can do it so quickly, and I can't see that like that. But you guys don't get photos, uh, so not like we do. No, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's amazing, John. I mean, it's, 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 just, it's just out of control. It really is. You know, you sit there and you get like a – uh, a unistellar or a stellina or you get something like that you hit the button you go to bed you have four glasses of wine you go grab your phone you take hey, a look you say, oh, oh let me say that oh. is, is that why oh. the is that wrong were, is that wrong we're tracking trailing is that why oh. is the wine or was it look, field you don't rotation? have to have four glasses of wine but maybe two okay so <laughs> depends on how much pain two you're for in. dinner right. two for breakfast right there's your four right. <laughs> but I will say this for everybody. I don't have my fingers in the camera, but for all of you, one of the astro imagers out there, we still want you to learn the night sky Absolutely. because there's only so but many it, images really of the no rosette. Not to learn. That's right. Yeah. yeah, and that's what's going to distinguish you. That's what distinguishes Dan Higgins, John Schwartz, the other astro imagers out here. That's what okay. distinguishes them, even. I know you haven't had the moon on, you know, the moon uh, mm -hmm. thing. What distinguishes <laughs> pictures is, yeah, I just said the moon thing. It, I'm going to go We're wrong for that in comments. <laughs> but, we all give back yeah, help and help show the glory. Yes, yeah. and we know what we're looking at. David Iker's interesting objects. How are you going to find those unless you learn the night sky? So that's your challenge out there. Don't that's just right. paint it at the same thing 
or the Milky Way, you know, a lot of, a lot of astral images that are want to sell, they want to make money, you know, shooting these objects. Well, you know, in order to do that, you know, sometimes you have to get lucky and catch something extraordinary. If you're the first to shoot an image and you happen to catch a supernova that's erupting, you, you know, that's where it becomes a scientific thing. So, yeah. So, yeah, so don't worry, you, your spot is safe because you've been doing it for 20 years. You might decide, hey, I want to shoot something unique that, you know, I don't see a lot of on the Internet. Oh, yeah. Let me go after, you know, yeah. let me get to see that region and images, Those images from uh, Bob Fugate were well, awesome. A lot of them were I mean, awesome. Bob Fugate was I've uh, never seen before. So, yeah, that that's just really cool stuff. Uh, uh, just on, on a side note, and I'm going to do a little plug here before I get off, and I'll get off. Okay. But, uh, John, yes, you sir. know, three out of the four people have something in common on this on this picture right now. You know what they all are? What's that? We love Scott. Well, th well we do. <laughs> <laughs> we do. That was a good one. You got me. Okay, so I there's two. Relationship. <laughs> I there's knew I couldn't get day. it wrong. <laughs> three, three of us have been on Astro World TV, so I got to get you on. Wow, that oh, would yeah. be great, man. I, I'm all yeah. in. There you go. I'll, I'll send you an email later. We'll get you on. Thank you. Wow, that's an honor. Appreciate that. I'm, absolutely. Absolutely. We'll Another always place. look for more guests. I'd love okay. to uh, yes. get on there and, and give, you know, give some more back. Oh, they don't. Sharing is, is the ultimate gift, you know, for me. Sharing is caring. Um, right. If I didn't have sharing is caring. I it appreciate it. You know, although you know why I do this anyway, it's all in the honor of, I give everything credit to the creator. Of course, yeah. you know, yeah. we're gifted with. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. There is a, you know, you've got you've got a Vatican observatory. You've got some that are watching that may be atheists. What brings us all together? The night sky, the universe. That's I right. wonder. That's right. It, regardless of your higher power, we are still all joined as humanity. Some of us give you know, give all due respect to the creator. But our regardless of belief, we still agree on one thing. The Orion Nebula is absolutely beautiful. It's awesome. Yeah. That's right. And and so so that's, right. there's, that, that's what brings us all together. We're we're in a we're in a period. And Scott, if you don't mind, I'll hurry up and go through my uh, quick <laughs> yeah, little yeah, yeah. So guys, that's we're gonna, gonna move on. There. We're gonna move on. But, uh, but Dan, thank you so much. Nope. We will tune in good to and, again. Uh, watch Astropalooza. I'll be there. And, I know uh, you better be, or else I'm gonna have to fill a half hour. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we'll fill it. You don't mind out. if I run over, do you? I might start from the beginning. Well, I'm going my... to. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to start sharing okay. while the introduction is going okay, on. Here if we I go. can, I guess I'll yeah, do take care. Go. Everybody, take have care. a good night. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. Bye bye. All right. And it's all yours, Adrian. All right. So let's there see if go. this works. All right. I'm sharing my screen. So I'm going yeah. to turn this way, and we're going to go to Google Photos. So one thing that I'll just go real quickly, this universe is great, but mankind's involvement in the universe is becoming pretty obvious when you take a look at this image of Lake Huron, and you see all of these colors. I captured it with an H-Alpha camera, and of course, I think my light in the truck just went off, so it's okay. I'll go in the back again. It's about these images. And you're seeing the dust lanes of this side of the Milky Way. I like to shoot the Orion side of the Milky Way because it is less often targeted than the more familiar galactic side. You'll see images like this, and you'll see them paired. But let's start with this. Let's look at that light dome. That's Colorado Springs in the distance when the Galactic Center was near back in um, mid-September when I was in Denver. And you'll notice the theme is light beams are growing, and it makes it a little tougher to view the night sky. You got a light beam coming from Windsor, 
over here and some from Port Huron in Michigan. So what happens is, compared to that last image you saw, notice how much of the sky is just missing. And then you've also got some green in here, which I do believe to be sky glow. So and yeah. those, if you point directly up at the sky, you get a uniform image, and it's just based on how dark your sky is. But in Canada, over Lake Erie, you see various light domes. We're looking at Windsor. We're looking at Detroit. And that Cygnus region we just saw, there is a Cygnus region right there. There's very little of it. And, um, and then a panorama looking to the southwest and southeast where Orion is rising right here. It makes for a beautiful image, but then you got a light dome, and you look at this and go, what's that big bright light dome right there? We look at it again, and you know, probably we're composing with this um, stick, and we're looking at the winter circle, which you've got some definition, some detail, some cloud, and a huge light dome. When I where I'm sitting, when I took this image, the Point Pelee National Park in Canada, we're looking to the southeast, and if you look at the city southeast of Point Pelee, you're running into Cleveland, Ohio. 50 miles across this lake, that light dome of Cleveland, Ohio is so great that it absolutely washes out this section of the, of the Milky Way. Now, you say, well, what else is there? That, this happens to be the part of the Milky Way when we talk about how big the universe is, here's a line. If we could look through the lake and down into the horizon, you would see the Magellanic clouds. This is as close as they get to mid northern latitude, and you can barely, you could probably barely see them in Florida. I'm not sure you'd actually see them in Florida. You know, if you if you take a higher ride, it is above the horizon. That's how low below the horizon the first one of the Magellanic clouds is. So we come tantalizingly close, but we don't get to see it. And and if, when you live in an urban area, there's a lot you just don't get to see because you don't go horizon to horizon. There's that Cygnus region and then this part of the bulge, but in a dark area where you can go horizon to horizon everything looks more magnificent. And I'm pretty much using the same settings to do these captures. Mm -hmm. Here you see this area here That's of cool. this part yep, um, in Black Mesa. And, you know, the because you can go down to the horizon, you see this region, which I do believe is, I want to say that's Northern Polsac, but I would have to look that up. Um, that dark region in that part of the Milky Way. And, and somewhere in here, before I turn it over to John to take us all out, there is a picture. I'll show this one because I think a lot of folks, panoramas, I always, you know, you just have to plan it. And then the other side of a room in a dark site is what I'm hoping to show. And all these images, I keep them because I use them to get ideas for my next images. Over here, this is how you see the universe with your own eyes. You see a lot of stars. You see Orion rising. You see the lake. That's a, that's a true to your eyesight image. And I think a lot more of those should be taken. You see that I do a lot of imaging with you know hydrogen alpha. But sometimes it's worth it just to capture what you see because a lot of folks, a lot of you that are watching, you're captivated just by the stars. And we ought to recognize that, especially when we want to use our images. We don't just want to use images to, you know, we, we repeat our themes sometimes, wood pointing at objects in the sky to show the connection between Earth as being a part of this big grand universe and then, you know, the the galactic arm over here. But um, there's so much, there's a lot to see here in a darker area in Michigan. You can see more 
we see more of this stuff. But there's a lot more to see and a lot more to explore. And we don't just want to show our pictures and, you know, just for the beauty of it. We sometimes want to show our pictures because we want people to realize that all of this is out there that's, and it's that's fascinating. Cool. It's fascinating. Even if you got a storm, I'll well, take a picture of that. You know, Earth weather, and imagine what this would be like if you were on Jupiter. And then try and see something. This is a naked eye visual type of image here. And um, and then finally, all of this is sitting in that region. When you're at a place where you can see a lot more because you don't have light domes, you may have sky glow, but you don't have light domes. Now all of a sudden you're looking at all kinds of detail that you didn't know existed. The Pleiades, the California, everything just pops out. And um, and it also lets you know when you take close-ups, these DSO, you know, these deep sky objects, the California is a very popular object. And, and so is the Rosetta. But these things are just, look how small they are compared to the rest of what's going on in this region of the Milky Way. They're a lot tinier when you compare it to the entire, that's the entire size of our galaxy. You've got a whole universe out there that you can look at. So so I'm going to end that here. Uh, let's see if I can okay. yep, stop by sharing there. there and, um, yep, and hopefully... You know, hopefully through the images, I'm able to share one. Let's see, this turns on. There I'm you able go. To share, you know, I'm able to share one, you know, how important it is to, um, to understand what you're looking at. And when you get interested in this hobby, you know, go ask questions about well, what's really there, what's not there. You're taking the pictures, you know, and, and you try not to you try not to do it just for yourself. It's for me it's often better if you're doing it so that you can share it with others. And sure, you know, if the images are beautiful, someone will probably tell you you should print those, you should sell them. There's absolutely nothing wrong with getting paid for some of your work. Of course if, not. Of course. Right. But if it's your focus. I think it does a little bit of a disservice to the sky itself because if you couldn't, if you lived somewhere, if we lived on a planet where you couldn't see any of this, there's just constant cloud cover across the entire planet, you lived on something like Venus and you couldn't see the sky like that, there would be nothing to image. There would, you wouldn't know it was out there. So I really think a lot of credit when it comes to astrophotography, visual astronomy, a lot of credit needs to go to the sky itself. Without that sky, you know, do we even build telescopes? Do we even do we come up with the technology and the know-how to understand how to capture light, how to understand that, how to build machines that actually rotate and track at the same rate that the Earth tracks, and then to realize. Some, it feels like it's very slow. Rotation is very slow, but when you get into the hobby, all of a sudden it feels like it, everything in the sky is moving faster than you wish it would. Especially if you're wide angle, you want the Milky Way over something, but all of a sudden the sky has moved in the four or five minutes that you've tried to capture, and now you have to move your camera in order to get the composition that you want for your shot because the sky moved. And if you're lucky enough, you can get realigned. You can, you know, you can align yourself with the North Pole if you know where the little dipper is. Even in a star-filled sky, it can only help you so that you can get there, get your shots, and you know, then you share them with you know whomever loves the night sky like you do. Yeah. So Scott, that's going to be it for me. Thank I you. I am going to uh, turn it back over. Because okay. wild man John Schwartz is waiting in the wings to close the yes, song. Yes, he's there. He's there. That's right. Yeah, I'm in a that, fog. Take it away. <laughs> yeah, I was explaining You're in that, that blue nebular light. Yeah, I'm preserving my night vision. 
because being visual, I have to protect my rods and cones um, from, you know, bright lights. You know, being on this platform, it's like I'm starstruck, you know, being able to uh, participate with some of the greats and, and some amazing artists and photographers, Adrian. <laughs> yeah. everybody on here is spectacular and and it's a real treat and i look really forward to these tuesday nights and um it's just a great thing you know yeah. we're doing what we love hanging out with uh great astronomers and great people in the audience and hanging with scott and uh learning about this universe how big it is it's really big Really, like really big. <laughs> this big. Well, yeah, wait, how big I is can't. it, John? <laughs> it's not big enough. Yeah, that's but, right. Uh, well, you know, you know it, it is. Um, uh, I, I think you've done a lot of astronomy outreach, John, uh, and a lot of the people on the show have. And some of these concepts where you are trying to um, take the uninitiated, you know, people who've never really looked up at the sky much, you know. Uh, or lo even look through a telescope. You start to uh, give them some details about, you know, uh, distances to even some of the nearby stuff, like you know, Saturn at almost 900 million miles away. Uh, you know, and they can see the rings around Saturn and stuff. And all of a sudden, you just see like this little this little light bulb go off in their head that, you know, they're looking across this expanse of space. You know. But that's just stuff in our own celestial backyard, you know. And so it's, um, uh, you know, w once you start talking about how many light years away something is, and then the the concept of time, you know, and all of that. So, uh, which actually we're going to get into in the next Global Star Party. So, um, the age of the universe and uh, our perception of time. There's cosmologists that believe that time is just an illusion so um so you know these these things are uh, these concepts like this uh are tough to get um to wrap your head around you know and and uh, so it takes takes people like you john and uh you know do astronomy outreach and study this stuff to help people kind of cross that river so you know it's like with the hubble telescope and then now James Webb, it just shows you and um, the Chandra and all these new telescopes, this yeah. new one that just came out. It's not as big, but it's showing you amazing things in different wavelengths, you know, other yeah. than our vision can see. We only get like a small sliver of the spectrum. Yeah. So and our, um, our, our perception is already skewed. You know, we're not really getting the, the you know, seeing the the full reality of what things are, you know, so. It's, it's a mind boggler, you know, every star party we go to, the question always comes up and, you know, we, we tell them, how far do you think this thing is? And they're like, we don't really um, know. I mean, it's gotta be real far. And it is so far away that you couldn't even believe it's like the light coming there left before the dinosaurs were even on the planet. It's just oh, yeah. really, you know, it's a time machine. It's a time machine. And and you travel as far as you can see light. And, you know, that's based on how much magnification or where you're located and the size of the aperture. You know, that'll give you a big jump and a, a big advantage in trying to figure out how far it is. But it's so far that. I don't think our minds can actually comprehend the distance that is actually there. But it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. It is absolutely amazing. Um, Bart Bach was using uh, things like, um, uh, you know, thinking of the Milky Way and the, the, the sun's rotation around the Milky Way is like a, uh, a celestial year for the sun, you know. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it helps to kind of have analogies like that, but because the num, as Bart Box said, the numbers, if you start talking about miles or kilometers, 
it, it, the number's so huge, it becomes meaningless to most people. You know, we, we, like I said, we're at star parties and, you know, some people actually break it down in the parking lot and they'll say, well, say this is the sun right here. Yeah. So if you were to look at Jupiter, it would be right there. And by the time they go all the way out to Pluto, I mean, you might be halfway across the world. <laughs> it's just, on. it's such a large as, uh, scale. As far as making a uh, solar system model. Yeah. Yes. Right. And, um, you know, and that's just right here. You know, the sun, the light takes how many minutes to get here? It's like eight minutes. And then, hmm. you know, the outer planets, it takes time. You're seeing them as they were minutes ago. Right. So it's kind of crazy. But this is a picture of my friend Andrew, and hopefully I'll get him on here. You know, he was doing some really good drawings. He was just kept staring up. I go, dude, what are you looking at? And he's like, man, it's just amazing how bright the milky way is it's like you can touch it but it's just so far away and you know it's just intriguing that it it's something you could never grasp you know in your physical state but i mean if you could go faster than the speed of light you could probably do anything you wanted you know mm. and this is the other star party and you know it's the same time we all get together and then we take a break we have our coffee and Usually that's the question we always ponder is, is uh, how good everything looked and amazing. And, and it's so far away. And, you know, when you get the great nights, it's really a treat to see, oh, yeah. but you know, from here on earth, we look, we wonder now just throw yourself out even further and you're out, you know, looking at galaxies. I believe this is 23 million light years, M 51, another version. Beautiful. And just to be able to reach that galaxy and see it, and that's actually a, a close one, one of the closer ones, would be spectacular to be able to get to that distance and close the gap. And then now you're out in space. You've been flying for 20 months at a, like a quarter speed to light. You're not even making a dent. You're not even like a tenth of the yeah. way there. Right. Already people are growing older you know time is slowing older. down the faster you go the farther you go you can yeah. go so it looks like you'll never get there you just keep going and it just seems like it's always out of your reach and you know this is the james webb the farthest picture we have i think it's 28 billion light years back and that's that star they found it's like the biggest brightest star they ever recorded and then there's a galaxy cluster there that is pegged at 28 billion i think but if you're looking at those faint red galaxies in the background they're red shifted so that puts those galaxies at like just a couple probably billion years after the big bang or whatever i i know they're trying to debunk that i mean probably eventually they may figure out how it really works but it's just a great instrument. And the further along we go in time, I believe that we figure a little bit more out about, you know, the age of the universe and how we're a part of it and just why we study it, because we need to understand, you know, how this works. And um, that's going to take some time. But I think, you know, with all the great minds working on it and everybody involved in astronomy you know you never know who could figure out the the distance True. or how it works True. but that's the reason why it's so important to uh, you know live in a and somewhere where you're free to study you know uh what you will and um uh you know there are there are places in the world where this you know studying science is repressed and i think it's one of the biggest crimes in humanity myself you know so yeah it, it's such an important thing that we understand because eventually you know our planet won't sustain or the sun will come to the end of its life and at that point you have to make a decision and that is well, should i be gone stay long before that yeah <laughs> you but, know a uh, lot of songs come to mind yeah 
um, should I stay or should I go, go, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to um, change gears. So that was my um, little presentation for the title, uh, the size of the universe. So now I'll go on to what I wanted to do. And I'm basically going to talk about the advantages of the digital, how it's really helped me out and uh, given me a great ability to, to share and create works as if we were traveling out there and, and trying to give you a closer look and a more spectacular view and also brighten your day and make you like, you know, what you're seeing and just, create great stuff so we can all enjoy it. But I was an artist in college, had a little car fire, totaled all my portfolio, all my works, everything. I did have a shirt, but it was partially burned, um, but I made it, you know? So, so I, I just yeah, basically kind of, before. I, I remember yeah, I, it just tells you why I, I kind of shifted you know, I always thought digital was cheating. Um, I guess because you're not drawing it and you're, you know, you're using a picture or you're, you're creating stuff on a computer where you can manipulate it. And, um, you know, I fought technology for a long time, but, you know, you have to embrace the things that are tough to do. It's just another, Learn. another yeah. way to paint, another way yeah. to sing. Right. So. And, and then, you know, you have to label them. But this is a standard format. This is how the purists and I want to make something clear that sketching this way is the absolute purest form because it's just you, the telescope, the eyepiece under the stars. You're sketching with a little red light with a pastel powder. Or you can use a, a pen or a pencil on white paper. And, um, you know, you draw your circle on your card to make your template so you can label everything. And it just tells you the object, the constellation, the telescope, the magnification, location, and, you know, sky quality. Just all the things that you saw on that night. And it keeps a record like an observing log, but it's a, a picture record, too which, you know, you can go back to and you'll rem remember certain things about that night just when you see that picture because you drew it. Also helps you a lot. Here's another example, M76, the little dumbbell. You know, everybody's style is a little different. It's also hard to photograph them and, and get them on. You have to play with that. You can see there's a little color shift. But the reason I went to digital is because I really want to I want to take it, you know, I want to go as far as I can and keep it real. But, you know, utilizing all the advances we've had with astrophotography and then, uh, you know, even just doing cell phone astronomy or or simple sketching, you can combine so many of these together and and then work a new style. So this is actually the first one I did. This was actually on an envelope. I was uh, drawing it just a rough with a pen, a ballpoint pen. You know, I used to do pen paintings where I could actually shade with a pen. If I just feathered it just enough, you could get it to actually shade. But if you go overboard, you get ink spots and then, then you're you know messed up. You, you just lost your mid-tone. But this was actually a complete pen sketch on an envelope, a manila envelope. And I was showing my friend and then I uploaded it, inverted it and went to work. And this is what I was able to do. It's the skull nebula, but it doesn't look, you know, NGC 246. But it's, it's a cool attempt. And I realized that the lighting effects are really incredible, how the stars glow. And, and you can create subtle tones and, and um, very subtle clouds and stuff. This is just the first real try. So, you know. This is another typical sketch in the field. You sketch it on, I like white paper because, you know, it's hard to see black on white. It takes a real keen eye and, um, you know, I'm getting older now. So white is easy because you can see it in mm -hmm. a pencil. Then you can upload it, invert it. Boom. That's what you can create just from that pencil sketch. You can rework it, colorize it 
bring out the greenish hue that your eye sees in those planetary nebulas. You know, in the telescope, it looks a lot like that on a great night. You see the extended arms. That's why they call it the Saturn Nebula, because mm -hmm. it appears like Saturn. And this is more what it would look like as a, you know, refined field sketch. What, what people would expect to see on cloudy nights. But again, it really helps you with your um, ability to see fainter objects and you train your eye really good what to look for. And, and you have to spend a lot of time doing these. That's why it's such a beneficial thing, sketching them, because you can really pick out details and it, it makes your eye very keen and able to tease out the finest peripheral detail that usually a lot of people miss and then that's where you could take it this is my latest uh you know there are clouds of dust and and um blown out star matter so it's really hard to get it perfect it's not quite a hard edge it's almost gelatinous or like mist you know smoky it's just very difficult to capture digital does give you a big advantage allowing you to just if you don't like it go back or just save that and then rework start over so here's another example this was um oh, the cat's eye cool. nebula yeah in uh draco 6543 ngc so you know this is accumulated sketch this is like a lifetime of work it's combining every sketch that i did through my meager instruments you know even the 28 uh, compared to the 60 inch is not going to give you this kind of and and some of the nights when you get those gifted nights where the fog comes in in Pasadena and blacks out everything and you look at those planetaries then and it's dark and it's clear and, and you'll never see anything quite like it it's it's mind-blowing to see the detail and that's what you can create for a finished product. You know, digital allowed me to get in there and um, invert it and then soften it, you know, with a Gaussian blur. You can use those in Procreate or even in um, Photoshop Express. They have a couple different ones, luminance. Um, so it's like a noise canceler. So you can, you know, slide the tab. It makes it softer. Uh, you can also use a filter to soften it, but just amazing effects. Look at the color and, and the spirographic structure inside of that. Just uh, very rare to see that in a in a actual eyepiece. You know, it's might might be a little beyond uh, because I like to take it as far as I can get it. You know, like we're actually going there because, you know. The telescope's much like a time machine. And when you look in that eyepiece, you're going back in time. And the photons, there's nothing like it. I think it's it's almost like um, some kind of a rejuvenating tonic. It just seems to like, like when I get done observing, I've been up all night. I'm still energized just on the thoughts of what I saw and how good. It's just so magical to see those in incredible views on those best nights through the big scopes it's nothing quite like it amazing and sharing it you know showing others this was a like an eagle sketch you can see it it's pretty basic so you can really do basic stuff you know you can also take notes of things that stood out like well that star really had you know diffraction spikes coming off of it or you know, that one side of the um, nebula had this like dark, which if you invert it, it's light. So you have to, you know, draw in backwards. It becomes pretty easy once you do it a few times. You know, then you invert it, bring it in, procreate. But bam, look at that. <laughs> so now you have the Eagle Nebula. And, you know, this is trying to show you exactly what it looked like in the eyepiece of the big, big scope with a, a real good night and a filter. 
because in order to see that actual structure, it, it's very rare, even with a big scope, that that really presents itself. But if you're out there a lot and you're really, you know, looking on many nights, you'll get that rare night and uh, see it. And when you see it for yourself, I mean, that's what Hubble took a picture of, the pillars of creation. And, and James Webb, if you've seen the new picture, wow, that's amazing. Mm. But, you know, from Earth, you get to see something like that. It's pretty, it's almost like a spiritual moment if you can see it. This is another one, the swan that I did. This took quite some time. Uh, you know, I use uh, blending stubs, HB, 2B, 4H pencils, um, magic rubber racer to take out the, you can actually shade in with the blending stub and do your soft mid tones and then erase away and it, and it gives you some real pronounced hard edge. You can create dust lanes or little, you know, stars, whatever, anything you want. And then when you invert it, this is what you get. Of course you have to work on it. It's not always perfect. So you continue to work and then you can do this. Bam. Color. Look at that. So that is almost like what you're going to see with uh, the 32 or the 28 looking through, say, a Nikon Nav 17 or uh, one of the Explore Scientific 92 degree. Those those are amazing. Or even in Ethos, any one of those three eyepieces with that filter is going to show you this kind of view in the big scope. Absolutely amazing. When you see it for real, you just can't believe how far out the nebulosity goes. Um, it's a lot farther than what you normally see. You know, the filter really helps too. And then, you know, you can also create like a contest winning sketch. You never know. Invert it. And there's M51. So it, it's absolutely amazing um, the effects now. And this is probably a later, you know, rendering. So it gives you an idea of the progression, but the effects you can create like the H2 regions subtly glowing, you know, you just barely pick that up and you need to look at, you know, the spiral arms for quite some time for those to pop out, but you can actually see them. I mean, that's a, another island in space. You can also create beautiful flowers from your cell phone photograph to share with your mom. If she's not feeling so good, you can try to brighten her day, hmm. cheer her up with a little color and just a thoughtful note, you know, just thinking about you. want to make sure you're doing good. So here's some digital flowers. They never die. <laughs> you can do artistic style ones and different looks and I dropped a couple more. Let me get back, but I've got to go back to my thing. You know, got a few more that I wanted to add to that. Now I can finish. This was a, a tree that I walked by every day and it was so beautiful. It's a rubber tree. And these colors are pretty much what I was seeing. Uh, different times of the year, it kind of changes from a, a blue and a dark. And then it gets to a lighter green with the, the red. They turn purple, the tips. It's like one of the most beautiful trees, even though most rubber trees don't look that good with the color. It's another one I like to uh, save to show people. Here's a, a, just a standard photograph, you know, and you can do the levels and brighten up the colors a little to make it more effective, more wow factor, and just beautiful. My little buddy always comes with me, and um, it allows you to, you know, take his picture and then put that beautiful colored border in there to match and create this beautiful little masterpiece of 
my best little buddy that always comes with me when I walk, you know, we walk together and we always look up and see the clouds and tonight's moon was so beautiful uh, with the clouds, and the winds are blowing here where I live. So it's really brutal with the winds. I mean, the Santa Ana's, but it does make a crystal blue sky and uh, the clouds and the moon looked amazing tonight. You know, sometimes you have to take a picture when they're not so happy. Uh, he didn't like his sweater, and my wife made him use it. <laughs> I said, it's just for a minute. Let's just put it on and take a picture, and then when we get around the corner, we'll take it off. That's what we did. <laughs> and then, you know, you take a picture of your little buddy when, you know, you had such a great time doing this and a great time we all had together but you know it's time to say goodbye and uh until next time you know we're excited to come back every time so that's my presentation all right john thank you very much oh yeah um, i want to um i want to uh thank all of our presenters uh and um, uh, I want to thank our audience for tuning in uh, to the uh, 136th Global Star Party. We will be back next week, uh, November 28th, for the 137th Global Star Party. Uh, and this one's titled The Age of the Universe. And so um, we will uh, uh, pull together some familiar faces and some new faces also on the, uh, on the next Global Star Party. So... Stay tuned, and uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, John, for uh, uh, hanging in there with us. And, oh, thank uh, you, Scott. Creativity and your inspiration, and um, um, I really love the comments that we had for uh, in the live chat here. Uh, I do want to add that we had. Uh, um, I, I, I was keeping track of uh, viewership of the. Uh, 135th Global Star Party, uh, and um, while we don't get a big live audience, uh, we get a fairly sizable uh, audience that watches after the fact, and uh, so we had, um, our reach was something like nearly 50,000 people, um, and uh, actual viewership is uh, 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 climbing up on 7,000, so um in uh aggregate uh we get uh we do what, our, what we're supposed to do and this is astronomy outreach and we hope that uh our uh, variety of uh pre presenters and topics that they cover um uh you know uh, adds to your own inspiration and imagination and encourages you to look up and get uh, uh connected with the universe in your own way so um, again, thanks, and uh, we will uh, be back uh, next week. Um, and until that time, uh, do as uh, our, our old friend Jack Horkheimer always used to say, and that is to keep looking up. Take care. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks. Thank you. Good, evening. Good night. Good night. Come one, come all to the Southern Cross Astronomical Society's 2024 Winter Star Party. Celebrating 40 years of stargazing, happening from February 5th through the 11th, 2024 on Scout Key in the beautiful Florida Keys. Get away from the cold and adjust your latitude underneath the pristine skies of Southern Florida with breathtaking views of Eta Carina, the Jewel Box, the Southern Cross, Centaurus A, and of course, the magnificent Omega Centauri. Tickets will go on sale on or about October 1, 2023 at SCAS.org. See you there. Are your eclipse glasses safe for looking at the sun? Let's check to see if your Eclipse glasses can handle the heat, or if they need to stay inside. First off, never check your Eclipse glasses with the sun. That's a good way to injure your eyes. 
Take your Eclipse glasses and find a bright light, like a lamp or a flashlight. Hold your Eclipse glasses up to the light and look through them. The light will appear extremely dim or not appear at all when looking through the glasses. For example, you should only be able to see the filament of a light bulb, but not the glow surrounding the bulb. Also, if your Eclipse glasses have any marks or scratches on them, don't use them. If you have older Eclipse glasses from a previous Eclipse, give them the check to make sure they haven't been damaged or scratched. All safe Eclipse glasses will meet the ISO 12312-2 standard. It's best to store Eclipse glasses in a safe place where they won't become scratched or punctured. Remember, never look at the sun without Eclipse glasses or a solar filter. Be safe and happy sun viewing, everyone.